All right, good people. Welcome everybody to the live stream. Another panel discussion here. I have two very special guests joining me. We have the boxing librarian and scrapbook boxing gentlemen. Hello um, to scrapbook and random. I am super excited for our latest live stream on our three man panel. Um, we're building up quite a collection of great live streams now. Um, a lot of people out there have enjoyed them, so I'm looking forward to this one as well, especially hanging out with you two fellas, uh, my best friends on here. So, yeah, looking forward to it. It's great to have you. Scrapbook, how are you doing, sir? Oh, wait, hold on. Scrap had to leave and come back in. My fault. Scrap, you there, my friend? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, loud and clear. Do you have a way to turn your volume up a little bit, Scrapbook? Uh, let me see. If you go out of StreamYard and come back in, if you go to settings, there's an audio setting where you can manually turn your volume up. Oh, I, I could hear him fine. Can you not hear him, Random? It's quiet. If we had this last time. It's just it's going to end up sounding quiet compared to us. How about now? No, oh, that sounded OK. It's still quiet. I mean, I can make out what you're saying. There's no bass in your voice. Okay, I'll no big deal. Out. I'll come back out. No problem. Okay. Yeah, I noticed listening back to the last one, BL, we had Scraps' mic was a lot lower than ours. Oh, okay. I got a big mouth. I got a loud voice, so I boom. Oh, and I ramble on, so everybody hears me when I'm yapping. <laughs> right so my volume was like a nine you were around a nine out of ten and he he was somewhere around like a four so if you listen to headphones you can hear it but on a on a speakerphone it, it's very soft welcome uh -huh. briefly okay. welcome to everyone in the chat while uh scrap comes back in and also the playback gang of course okay here's scrap let's see if this is any better can you hear me better now that is a little better scrap it's a little bit louder Oh boy. I th I think we're going to be all right. Yep. All so good, everybody good. as it says in the title so we're doing the, as always the panel's adopted no preset criteria we just it's just a topic and then we're just going to talk about some stuff. We're going with five underrated boxers pre 1940. Somewhat of an arbitrary line but uh you know it's we're essentially just looking at the gloved era up to 1940. We each just pick five fighters. We think deserve some extra shout out. And because that time period, almost every fighter prior to 1940 is underrated compared to how good they were because, you know, t time distills down even great fighters memories. So absent a couple of guys, pretty much everyone's underrated. So it's a very broad pool of athletes that we're going with. Who do we decide is going to start, gentlemen? Um, I decided I will go. Um, so I will be the first to kick off. As soon as you give the word, I'm raring to go on my first fighter. Fantastic. Take it away. So uh, big shout out to everyone in the chat. And um, yeah, big shout out to my friends, Random and Scrapbook. And it's great to be back on the panel. Uh, my first choice, okay, w one thing i tried to do is I've tried to go for fighters who were not world champions, okay, um, because I think many world champions automatically often get a recognition that many other fighters don't. Um, I've encountered this problem many times. Many fighters with great accomplishments or resumes do not get shouted out simply because they didn't hold a title. So I've tried to go uh, for fighters who didn't hold a title. And my first choice um was a rip roaring and i mean a rip roaring fighter um from the 1920s okay um he actually um turned professional in 1922 and he only fought until 1931 okay so he only fought for a period of nine years and in that nine years had over 100 fights now this fighter was a very game fighter he also possessed okay probably some of the fastest hands in the 1920s uh, some people said he punched faster than a flyweight uh, he was even known for literally jumping in the air and firing six or seven punches at you before his feet hit the ground okay he was a sensationally fast fighter a fast combination puncher um very game as well it is former top three rated lightweight sid terris now sid terris okay who was 
um, one of the best lightweights of the 1920s. Everybody talks about Benny Leonard and, you know, they talk about all these other fighters, but very, very few people ever mention Sid Terris. When you look at his win rate, okay, he did lose 13 fights from over 100, but when you factor that in his opposition, okay, combined with his phenomenal talent for fighting, you know, what you've got to realise is one of my fighters who I'll speak on um, had very quick hands, was a master boxer, you know, could almost rival Benny Leonard, you know, punch for punch in the ring. Uh, I'll get on to him later. But even he said after fighting Sid Terrace that he had never fought a man who punched as fast and consistently as Sid Terrace did. You know, the other fighter was known for having very quick hands, but even he said he couldn't match the speed of Sid Terrace's um, punching. Now, the thing is about that, when you've got a game fighter who's a very fast, aggressive puncher, he didn't have really what you would call much knockout power. He wasn't really known as a big puncher at all. In fact, he had little knockouts in his career, only scoring 12 knockouts. So like I've said many times, you know, he if he was getting beaten on the scorecards after eight rounds in a 15-round fight, he couldn't rely on his knockout power to get him out of trouble, okay? He had to win the rounds to win the fight. And like I've said many times, I always think that goes underrated. We all love big punchers. We all love their ability to turn a punch to turn a fight with one punch. You know, we all love those fights where the big punch is getting outboxed round after round, then they'll land that big shot and just take their opponent out, and it's thrilling. But sometimes I think we don't give enough credit to the fighters who can't do that, who, if they're five rounds down, have to fight even harder to win the rounds to claw the points back to try and get the result. Sid Terris is one of these, and he was an exceptional fighter. Now, two things I want to highlight, okay, on his resume, okay? This is a perfect description of what Sid Terrace is like. I want to just detail who he fought in 1925 alone. What I'm going to go through for you to show why I feel is underrated is this is a one calendar year, only one year, 12 months. Now, the first name he beat was Jimmy Goodrich. Now, Jimmy Goodrich would go on to win the lightweight um, title um, tournament, okay, uh, if I remember he beat Stanislaus Loesa in the final, uh, another fighter I'll bring up actually fought in that tournament as well getting quite far, but in 1925 okay, Sid Terry's defeated um, Jimmy Goodrich, who were a top five lightweight at the time, he lost okay, to the number one lightweight in the world, Sammy Mandel also that year defeated the ring champion in annual rankings that year, Rocky Kansas. So already in this one year, he's defeated Jimmy Goodrich, former lightweight champion. He's lost on points to Sammy Mandel. He's defeated Rocky Kansas. He then defeats Johnny Dundee, then defeats top 10 rated contender Lou Peluso, then defeats Johnny Dundee a second time, then defeats top 10 and top three contender Ace Hudkins, then defeats top 10 contender Charlie O'Connell, then defeats top 10 contender Basil Galliano, he also then defeats by knockout Jack Bernstein, former super featherweight, one of the first super featherweight champions, who also that year in annual ratings ended as a top 10 lightweight in the world and was top three rated in his career. He also defeated in that year the excellent Harry Kid Brown before then defeating Jack Bernstein a second time and then gaining a second win over Basil Galliano. So all of that, what I've just mentioned, was just in one 12-month period. OK, now he fought other fighters outside of that. You know, he fought Billy Patrol. He fought uh, a late fight series with Pete Nebo, who was another top 10 contender. He fought later on Stanislaus Loeza, OK, who got to the final of the lightweight tournament. But another period I want to shout out is a period in 1927 when he defeated top 10 super featherweight that year. Uh, top top five lightweight that year, sorry, Billy Wallace, an excellent fighter. Uh, top 10 super featherweight that year, Babe Herman. Top 10 light welterweight that year, Stanislaus Loeza, okay? The number one light welterweight in the world, Ruby Goldstein, defeated in one round. Top 10 lightweight, Phil McGraw. Top five welterweight, he lost to Hilario Martinez. And then he won and lost to top 10 lightweight that year, Phil McGraw. So that shows another thing. He's fighting fighters and defeating fighters who were rated in one year across multiple divisions. That year alone, in the annual rankings, he fought fighters who were rated at super featherweight, lightweight, Light welterweight and welterweight. In one year, he fought fighters who were rated across four divisions. So basically what you've got in Sid Terrace is an outstandingly fast puncher, a game aggressive fighter who could punch all day long.
Okay, he was just a ferocious puncher, lightning fast. Even fighters with quick hands, he could outspeed them. Many fighters in that lightweight tournament and many contenders around at the time were not that keen on fighting him, okay, because he could make almost anybody look bad. Um, the incredible fight runs he took part in, even fighting guys like Rosie Stoy, a very underrated fighter um, from 1920s, even fighting fighters like Eddie Wagner, um, who he won and lost to. But, you know, he was a top 10 super featherweight in that time. Plus all the other fights he had, including those incredible runs across 1927 into the, because even even after that run I gave you in 27, going from Billy Wallace to Phil McGraw, he goes straight into 1928. His first four fights a Jimmy McLarnin, who he lost to, okay, he beat Eddie Mack, okay, he was a former top three contender, lost to Ray Miller, and then beat Phil McGraw again. So you're talking, okay, about 13 fights on the trot against top opposition in one run. No weak opponents in between. You know, when you add that to his 1925 run, you realise that in that small period, he was active 1922 to 1931, he crammed an incredible amount of work. In fact, in that period, he had nearly 50 fights against rated fighters alone. He was top three rated at lightweight for four years on the trot. Okay, every single year for four years, he was rated um, top three on the trot. So Sid Terrace is my first underrated fighter, someone who should be given more um, um, credit. Wow, fantastic. Scrap, you always, as always, folks, we, we sometimes add on at the end before we go to the next one. We're just going free form here. Scrap, you want to add on or move forward, sir? Well, first of all, I'm going to say that BL, believe it or not, I had Sid Terrace on my list. He was on the list. And I didn't add him to the list officially, but he was on the list. Sid Terrace was a hell of a fighter, Jewish fighter. He knocked out Ruby Goldstein in one round in the polo grounds. And what happened at that time, during those days, you had champions on your block. There wasn't official world champions, but they were champions to you and your community. And Sid Terrace and Ruby Goldstein were from the Lower East Side at that time. I had a friend named Teddy, and he told me this story, that all the shops in the Lower East Side, Cherry Street is where he lived, they all closed down. This was a big deal. The way you have a world championship fight now, that's how that fight was with Goldstein and Sid Terrace. So when Sid Terrace fought Ruby Goldstein, knocked him out in one round, Ruby Goldstein had refereed Randy Turpin and Ray Robinson in 51. And the thing about that particular fight, Ruby Goldstein was that referee. And Dr. Nardiato went over to Ruby Goldstein and said, Ray, I need you to get it together, otherwise I'm going to stop the fight. He couldn't talk to Ray that way, so he said it to Ruby Goldstein. Ruby Goldstein has sympathy for not stopping the fight in the 10th round because Ray Robinson had a cut over his eye because he remembers the evening of what it felt like to be a New York fighter, and he was knocked out in one round with Ruby Goldstein, with uh, Sid Terrace. So Sid Terrace was a hell of a fighter, great choice, BL. I, I, I wish I chose him, but I'm glad you did. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So my fighter, the first one I'm going to choose is Harry Harold Smith, the Harlem Thunderbolt. Harry Smith was an unbelievable puncher, like Julian Jackson was. He was born October 28, 1907 in Kingston, Jamaica. The thing about him, his father had real estate in Jamaica, brought that trade over to Harlem, New York. His father had real estate in Harlem. He had taxi cabs and limousine services in Harlem, New York. Now, Harry Smith wanted to be a mechanical engineer. His father wanted him to be a dentist. But Harry Smith wound up working in a novelty shop and he would receive a tip. Young man laid it on a table. The other guy who worked with Harry Smith had grabbed his change. Harry Smith asked him for his change back. The young man acted like he didn't know what he was talking about. Harry Smith said, let's step outside. Harry Smith wound up getting a bloody nose and he walked right into Grubbs Dinner on 116th Street and that's how he began his career. Now, he started boxing in 1927 as an amateur. He ended up with a career record of 60 wins, no losses and 55 knockouts as an amateur. During that time, he would win a Canadian Amateur Middleweight Championship. He would win an inner city middleweight championship, the Metropolitan Amateur Championship. What was amazing about that Metropolitan 
middleweight championship. It hadn't been done again. Well, not so much middleweight, but just that Metropolitan since Ray Robinson in 1938 when he picked up the Bantamweight championship at the Metropolitan event. And that was amazing. Harlem went wild when that happened. But he defeated Homer Robinson. Let me tell you about Homer Robinson. He was known as the Black Ghost. Homer Robinson had a record of 42 and 0 before he met, well, it was 41 and 0 at that time, but before he met Harry Smith. Harry Smith was the man who defeated Homer Robinson. Homer Robinson was knocking out everyone. They were afraid to face Homer Robinson in the amateurs. The only other man who had a record of 42 and 0 in the amateurs was Ezra Charles from Cincinnati. So Homer Robinson was a hell of a fighter. But Harry Smith was undefeated, knocking out everyone. Powell Silvers, you name him, he knocked him out. But towards the end of his career, he died at the age of 33. And 1933 was the year that he died. And he was sick. You know, he started losing. I think he lost a total of seven fights. But he would have been undefeated, I believe, had that not happened to him. But he's such an underrated man that Box Rex did not have him as a colored middleweight champion until just recently. No one really heard of Harry Smith. Harry Smith had got jobs for a fighter by the name of Wallace Cross and Danny Cox at the Harlem Opera House, which was located on 125th Street across from the Teresa Hotel. My grandfather knew who Harry Smith was, and he told me the ability this man had to throw a punch it was almost like Mike Tyson knocking someone out, and he was a middleweight. So I had to acknowledge Harry Smith. He was an unbelievable fighter. When he fought Powell Silvers, Silvers had a record of 75 wins, 36 losses. He had 122 total bouts, fought 727 rounds, brought that experience into the ring with Harry Smith. Harry Smith defeated him. So I just wanted to acknowledge Harry Smith. He was a hell of a fighter. He really was. Oh, fantastic scrapbook. Good shout. Excellent shout. So I struggle with who to highlight here because they're pretty much everyone is underrated because a, a lot of a lot of the just casual audience thinks that people didn't figure out how to box until recently or until fights were filmed in color. You know, like boxing is way ahead of the media curve. In fact, it helped bring in it was riding the forefront of the media curve back in the day, motion pictures. Well, boxing was the perfect thing for it. Um, but the, the gentleman I want to highlight for, for this one is Fireman Jim Flynn, who's uh, of Italian descent. That's not his name. Uh, but he, he fought. So this Flynn is an interesting character because he was capable of some really good wins. He got a win over Sam Langford in one of their fights. He, uh, he knocked out Jack Dempsey when Dempsey was a prospect. Flynn was hyper aggressive. He had like one mode, which was get close, stick your face in their chest, clinch something possibly, but throw in hooks largely. But like, he wasn't like a range fighter. He would close the gap. He would do damage. He was incredibly tough. And, uh, and he's, he's just considered like the, one of the guys that Jack Johnson schooled that, that sort of underrates who he was, this wasn't a time, he was sort of a light heavyweight size fighter generally to, to a small heavyweight at a time when light heavyweight wasn't really that established. You know, you got, you know, George Gardner took it, lost it to Fitz, lost it to Jack O'Brien. Jack O'Brien didn't care about that. Light heavyweight was literally seen as the light heavyweights, as in not the heavyweights, as in it's like a, a bonus almost like a bonus thing now in like the teens the later teens and the the 20s and the 30s light heavyweight was on fire but that that wasn't necessarily the case even though there were some very quality fighters of that size competing with good schedules so if you look at the beginning of flynn's career pretty clean record but his strength of competition got pretty cr got pretty crazy if you see guys on there hold on let me let me go back i'm gonna try not to get too long-winded so like many fighters, when he's fighting at the lower level of competition, prospects, he's doing really well. Has the loss to Tommy Burns, uh, but that's Tommy Burns, that's a champion. And so 
you know, yeah, he loses that fight, but he keeps going and he keeps going. But you see guys on there like Jack Twin Sullivan, George Gardner, who was, you know, as I said, was the light heavyweight champ, George Gardner of Lowell, Massachusetts, the largest of the three Gardner brothers, all good fighters. Tony Ross, Bill Squires, that battling Johnson on there in 1908, that's a different, that's not battling Jim Johnson, the enormous colored fighter. That's a different battling Johnson, but he got a couple on him. Loses to Al Kaufman, Jim Barry. Loses to Langford in 08. He goes out like easily in the first fight, but they fought again twice in 1910. And the first time in 1910, he gets he gets the win. But he, he you know, beats Billy Papke. I mean, Scrap and Biel, you guys know some of the names on his resume, as far as how tough a schedule was, is crazy. You see 1911, Al Kaufman, you know, former heavyweight title contender for Johnson beat Carl Morris, one of the White Hopes. I mean, he's just, but then you see, so when he fights Jack Johnson, it wasn't like a gimme fight. He had lost to Langford in 1910. I'm going to wrap this up in a moment. So you see, he went one-on-one -on -one with Langford, you know, climbing to like one and two in their series uh, in 1910. But after some time off, you know, getting thumped by Langford for 18 rounds or almost 18 rounds in one year is not a nice thing. So. He took some time off, but he's back. Look at his 1911. Capone, Al Kaufman, Carl Morris. So, so when he when he gets the shot against Johnson, he's earned that. They're um, they're more worthy contenders, but he's not. It's not a gimme fight. He's just he happened to be match up horribly with Johnson because Flynn kind of had that one way to fight, and Johnson was an expert at derailing guys who fought like that. So he could basically turn into a hard sparring match and could have. Finished it at will. But nonetheless, he keeps going. He keeps going. The career just keeps, keeps going. I'm going to speed up now. Fights Gumbo Smith, fights Jack Dillon, fights Battling Levinsky. These are all really powerful fighters. Fights Jack Dillon, Fred Fulton, Jack Dillon, all in 1916. They're losses, but those are incredibly tough. And he went the distance with Dillon, 10 rounds. 1917, knocks out Jack Dempsey, one of his great wins. And the excuse machine of the PR machine behind Dempsey tried to turn that into something other than it was after the fact. Plus, apparently, Dempsey had an, a bitter ex who, or, or an ex who was pushing certain ideas. But the newspaper on the, on the ground, yeah, they were like Dempsey was too busy counting his money, was the way they joked about it. And Flynn got him with a tricky pick from Sam Langford when he was picked up from Sam Langford in one of their fights. And he caught him with a... A nice two-piece. I think he just ripped the guard away and caught him flush. But, uh, you know, it wasn't a very long fight. He got Dempsey. It's a great win. He also has the win over Langford. But you see there he loses to Billy Misk. He's fighting all these great fighters and contenders. And it keeps on going. The strength of competition trails off at the end. But he'd already, because that's by the time he was fighting Langford in, uh, 23 and 24 he they were both long long past it but anyway i'm gonna wrap it up but fireman jim flynn he was extremely racist but he fought across the color line he didn't um he didn't draw the line so to me in a sport whatever someone's attitude is i want to see him fight the best he did his best to fight the best and was respected and he's just mostly remembered as a, a one of jack johnson's victims and I don't think that's entirely fair to him. It, do you guys want to add anything to that? But I'm going to I'm gonna close out. But Fireman Jim Flynn definitely deserves a shout. A lot better than he's remembered as as having been. But just a, a like a, a single style fighter, but one of the best aggressive come forward battlers of this of this really tough era. So he couldn't fight under clean rules. If you took he never went over to London to fight in the, in front of the National Sporting Club because he would have been disqualified round one. He loved, you know, headbutts, holding and hitting. Uh, you name it, Flynn threw it, and uh, but it worked against a lot of guys and a lot of serious people got surprised, including Dempsey, and that's that's probably his best win because there was some speculation Langford might have carried him or at least not given him the full treatment to to get a bigger booking. And in fact, like two or three days after their second fight, the the first bout they had in 1910, they did get a bigger booking, and they each got 25% of the film rights, and that that's a film that survives to today. 
uh, was it was scheduled for 45 rounds. Langford got him out of there in eight. But uh, so I think, yeah, Flynn's best win, Jack Dempsey, KO, an easy KO with a trick he picked up from one of the greatest of all time, the greatest of all time, Sam Langford. So shout out to Fireman Jim Flynn. BL, go for it, my friend. Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to say, um, yeah, it was a great choice from Scrapbook, Harry Smith. What a formidably strong, powerful puncher he was. Um, physique of a titan as well, you know, powerful, powerful frame. Slender frame, but very muscled and powerful. Yeah, a very good pick scrap. And yeah, Fireman Jim Flynn, I'll actually be covering him on one of my career videos, so I won't go too much into detail, but uh, on one of my heavyweight videos over the next few weeks, Jim Flynn will be covered. Um, so I'll highlight him there. But yeah, um, definitely one of the um, tough trial losses and... You know, a number of fighters like the fighter I'm going to mention next, you know, not regarded as a great fighter, but kind of fought everybody um, like Jim Flynn did. Uh, now, my next choice, OK, is the Pennsylvania Terror George Cole. Now, I've picked my picks for a number of different reasons. Um, George Cole had a career approaching 200 fights in length. OK, um, he fought also um, for a long time. In fact, he fought from 1894 into the 1910s. And in that time, amassed that massive um, career of nearly 200 fights. One of the reasons, one of the things I always say um, when I talk about boxing now is I've never liked how fighters now will um, haggle over a deal because their opponent may weigh five pounds more than them or they'll argue about hydration weight when they want to rehydrate 16 pounds and a 10 pound rehydration weight is put on it and it can scupper fights from happening. You know, one thing I always show a lot of respect to fighters for is those fighters who don't feel that way, who challenge all comers, okay, like another fighter I'll cover to come, who literally fought all comers, had no fear, didn't care. George Cole was one of those. He had to take a lot of fights because like all fighters, they have to fight to earn money. But when you're talking about the reason I picked him, I picked him because he was a fighter who proved himself a top opponent, a dangerous opponent across multiple divisions. Now, not only did he beat fighters, in fact, the best, probably the best way of going through it is, I just want to run through some of his opponents to highlight one of my main points. Now, we beat Bobby Dobbs. Now, Bobby Dobbs was a former coloured lightweight champion. Okay. He defeated Jack Blackburn, who fought also at lightweight and welterweight, et cetera, et cetera. He fought welterweight champions, okay, and welterweight contenders, okay, like Dixie Kid, okay, in a trilogy, Barbados Walcott in a trilogy. He also defeated um, Charlie McKeever and Dave Holly, two outstanding contenders of the time. Now he's not done there. He also fought, you know, middleweights, okay, like Joe Butler, who he defeated, Jung Peter Jackson, um, who he defeated. He fought a great light heavyweight, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, seven times. He also fought heavyweights, fighting a four-fight series with Joe Jeanette, winning one of them, um, and also defeating former heavyweight contender Joe Goddard. So one of the main things about why I chose George Cole is not only, did, not only did he fight champions who titled across weights from lightweight to heavyweight, but he fought fighters, many great fighters from multiple divisions. OK, whether it's great heavyweights, you know, like Joe Jeanette, whether it's a great light heavyweight like Jack O'Brien, you know, whether it's great welterweight like Barbados Joe Walcott, you know, whether it's all the trilogies he had, he just fought pretty much anybody of anybody of anybody. He had over 20 Hall of Fame fights. He had a losing record in there. But he was often fighting guys, often at short notice. You know, sometimes he'd have multiple fights in a year. You know, he wasn't always guaranteed that the fighters would be at his weight limit. You know, sometimes he'd have to, you know, even fight in other fighters like Jack Bonner, you know, who was pretty much a middleweight to light heavyweight contender, you know, um, fighting Jack Sullivan, you know, another fighter who moved across weights, fighting the excellent middleweight Mike Shrek. You know, so George Cole was chosen by me because not only did he build that incredible record, okay, um, of nearly 200 fights, you know, he scored over 120 wins in that run and scored nearly 40 KOs in that run, which when you think he's fighting as a, a fighter from around welterweight, middleweight, and he's fighting fighters who cover the spectrum, right, from lightweight to heavyweight, including Hall of Famers in multiple divisions. OK, um, that is why I chose George Cole. I think he's a very um, underrated fighter. Um, he fought a who's who of everybody, scored many great wins. I mean, even just talking about, you know, I've, I'm talking about the fighters he's fighting. OK, he defeated Bobby Dobbs. OK, he defeated Joe Butler. He defeated Jung Peter Jackson. You know, he defeated Dixie Kid. He defeated Joe Jeanette. 
You know, he defeated Joe Goddard, he defeated Charlie McKeever, he defeated Dave Holly. So it's not only the great fighters he's fighting, he also gained wins over many of them, plus the trilogies against Walcott, Jack Blackburn, you know, fighting Jack O'Brien seven times, Barbados Walcott three times, Jeanette four times. An incredibly tough career with many great wins in there. He also, aside from those, fought many, many other um, top fighters, like I mean, top contenders like Jack Bonner. You know, he had a whole fight series with Scaldy Bill Quinn, uh, had a whole fight series with Jack Twin Sullivan, fought fighters like Al Winey, Black Bill, Mike Shrek. I mean, the names who this guy fought is like a who's who. Even fighting other light heavyweights, middleweights to heavyweights like Morris Harris, um, you know, etc., etc. He just fought a who's who. Uh, that's why I chose George Cole as my second um, choice as underrated fighter. Wow, great choice. Scrap? That was outstanding. That was outstanding. George Cole was a remarkable, remarkable fighter, and I'm appreciative that he's on this list. He was really, really something else. And you're talking about underrated. That is an understatement. So great job, Bill. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, thank my, you, Scott. George Cole deserves it, for sure. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. My next fighter is Len Johnson. Leonard Becker Johnson. He was known as the English Flash. He was born October 22nd, 1902 in Clayton, Manchester, England. And he died September 28th, 1974. This story of Lynn Johnson is so prevalent to even fighters of today. Fighters who don't really know their history as well as they should. Because if they did, they would appreciate it more. I'm talking about fighters like Dick Turpin. Dick Turpin was the first European middleweight champion. Randy Turpin was the first world middleweight champion. Picked that title up in 51 when he defeated Ray Robinson. You have Anthony Joshua, who was unified as heavyweight champion. Nigel Ben was a middleweight champion. Lennox the Lion Lewis, heavyweight champion. Cornelius Boza Edwards. These are all champions, Chris Eubank. That wouldn't happen if it wasn't for Lynn Johnson. You see, Lynn Johnson was trying to get a title fight in the middleweight division with Mickey Walker. At that time, Mickey Walker had a problem. And his claws had the color bar. He was managed by Jack Kearns, who also managed Jack Dempsey. Harry Wills had that problem with Dempsey, 24. And Mickey Walker was offered $75,000 to get in the ring with Harry Smith, the Harlem Thunderbolt. It was rejected. And Lynn Johnson had a conversation with Mickey Walker and Jack Kearns. And he was told, if you took on Scotland's Harry, uh, um, Tommy Milliken, excuse me, then we'll give you a shot. He knew that Lynn Johnson couldn't fight Tommy Milliken because of Rule 24. In England, you had a rule that stated any man with an ounce of black blood in his body was not allowed to fight for a title. Let me tell you why that's significant. Because the Parliament Act in 1806, the abolishment of slaves. What was important about this act, you couldn't deport any black slaves anymore in England if they ran away. Now, why this was significant in the case of Lynn Johnson was because Lynn Johnson, after not getting an opportunity to fight Mickey Walker, he had to take on Harry Collins. He fought him in Australia. It was for the British Empire Middleweight Championship. He defeated Collins. But then he was stripped of that title because he was a black fighter. Well, he decided to get on the board after six terms. He finally made it on the board. Winston Churchill was instigating this rule of 24. And so black fighters were not allowed in the 
to fight. So finally, what happened was after getting on the board, he was able to rectify that rule. And that's the reason why the names that I mentioned, Dick Turpin and Randy Turpin and Anthony Joshua and Nigel Benn and Lennox Lewis, Cornelius Boza Edwards and Chris Eubank was finally allowed to fight for a title and win titles. So Lynn Johnson played a very significant role in this. Because like I said, if it wasn't for him, these opportunities would not be allowed to happen. When Lincoln had passed away, Reconstruction, 1865, the Parliament Act was that popular in 1806 because it was before the Reconstruction Act in 1865 when Lincoln went assassinated. So when you factor all these in, Lynn Johnson played a severe, severe accomplishment, not just to himself, but to boxing in general. And he played a significant role in England. So for that reason, that's why I have Lynn Johnson as my second pick, as very underrated, but at the same time, he was a significant fighter, a significant name in the game of pugilism. Yeah, if I may just jump straight in before we go to a scrapbook, uh, I think Len Johnson's scrap is an inspired choice. Um, doesn't get spoken of enough. Um, and yeah, that's certainly an outstanding choice for me. Definitely an underrated fighter. Thank you, BL. Yeah, that was a great tribute scrapbook. So yeah, so BL, you mentioned the next fighter I want to talk about. I'm not going to talk very long about oh, him. That? <laughs> you did mention you did mention him, and I hope. Uh, let's see. I'm going with Mike Shrek. I think he was oh. born in Cincinnati, but he fought a lot in Pittsburgh. But Shrek was considered one of the guys coming to the front at one point, and you can see like he's fighting biz. That's a busy uh, 1900. I think I actually mislabeled on this graphic. 1901 as 1900 1902 is 1901 but the guy was getting his fights in and he keeps going i, th I believe he was a southpaw although it can be confusing because it seems like guys would line up orthodox even if they fought southpaw maybe for the the spacing just like in the fight you know it affects how you actually look visually next to each other you can get a little closer so i've seen him line up as a as a righty but it seems like he was a southpaw fighter but um, had some good wins, fought some good fighters. You know, fight guys like uh, Marvin Hart, beat some over four rounds in 06. Who else did he fight? He lost to Jack, he lost to Jack Twin Sullivan. Jack Twin Sullivan. Whoa, very Randy, you just really fighter. I almost really bad. I'm sorry, is that any better? Oh, perfect. Okay, yeah, so I was saying, he lost to Jack Twin Sullivan. That's, I believe, the same year Jack Twin Sullivan beat Tommy Burns, who went on to be heavyweight champion of the world. But uh, Shrek got a win over Marvin Hart. He lost to Al Kaufman. Kaufman fought Jack Johnson. So that might have been one of the fights that sort of derailed his coming to the front status. But he did get another win over Marvin Hart in 09. He actually stops him in four, TKO in yeah, four. Yeah, yeah. Fights Langford that year. Definitely, he was overweight for the Langford fight because he was sort of a large middleweight. So he would have been he would have been fighting sometimes up in the light heavyweight. But when he fought Langford, it was a they were heavily critical of his form, and he got absolutely destroyed. And in fact, he got beat up so bad that the public safety commissioner. This is Per Claymore's book on Langford. The public safety commissioner. Well, actually, I don't know if that was in his book. I've saw, I've seen it in the paper though. Directly, I feel like I looked it up from seeing it, but I could be wrong. But I've I've definitely seen it. The safety commissioner refused to license a Langford fight with Montana Jack Sullivan, as distinct from Charlestown's Jack Twin Sullivan, but who was a light heavyweight who'd actually beaten fire, Fireman Jim Flynn. But he wouldn't let Langford fight him because, you know, sort of the optics, racial optics, or the fact that it was such an uneven matchup based on how badly Shrek got beat up. That just show you the esteem that Mike Shrek was held in 
that him losing badly in the first round was so much that a guy Langford size who had a, at least one really good win on his career had a respectful record wasn't even allowed to face the guy so maybe shrek declined very quickly but he was he was a he was a powerful fighter not a lot of lefties going on so it's it's just nice to see sometimes south and i think langford already fought a south park is tiger smith the welsh fighter who langford fought he was billed for the the english middleweight championship and of course like in those days this is the pre lonsdale belt so when we say build as like the club the national sporting club set the rules they were the standard at that time i don't believe they were competing clubs of any note until later when uh Hugh McIntosh opened the uh, the Olympia, and that's where Langford fought in nineteen fought Bill Lang there in nineteen eleven. But prior to prior to Langford basically destroyed um, Iron Hague in nineteen oh nine to win the English heavyweight championship. And I'm wondering, Scrap and BL, if that might be why they had the rule that color fighters couldn't fight for the championship because after Langford beat Hague so badly, Hague ended up fighting. I think someone for the vacant title when they sorted out maybe a year and a half later but i wonder if any colored fighter got a shot from that point on or if that went started with the lonsdale belt and just went on forever because langford actually won the english heavyweight championship although they were debating in the press they were like well can a canadian guy hold the english championship and and, and it was at the time when Langford was supposed to fight Jack Johnson for the world, for the, at that point, you, you know, the complete package of the heavyweight championship honors and it didn't happen. So yeah, when he beat Hague, I wonder if that's, that's where they were, when they brought in Lonsdale belt, they were like, we'll have no more of that, but it didn't matter. Langford went back to America to look for big purses. So he got stripped anyway, they stopped recognizing, but yeah, interesting stuff. But back to Shrek, I'm going on a Sam Langford tangent here. But uh, back to Shrek, yes, he got destroyed easily by Langford, but he had a lot, a lot of uh, tough fights and some good wins in there, some good losses too, as far as like the level of opponents. So Mike Shrek, Cincinnati's Mike Shrek. Well, yeah, if I may, I'll, I'll just add to that random. Also, Mike Shrek fought draws with fighters. I've just mentioned George Cole, and he also fought a fight series with Jack Twin Sullivan and also fought excellent um, middleweight contender and middleweight title challenger Hugo Kelly um in a multi-fight series and also about um, um mike shrek um he also fought a number of heavyweights you know he fought tony ross like you mentioned he fought al kaufman um he fought a fight series with dave betty fought jim jefford so there's another fighter um who fought fighters who fought across multiple weights and you know the the wins you mentioned you know like defeating tommy burns um you know he also defeated former light heavyweight champion and excellent fighter george gardner as well that's another um quality win on his resume he, he had to uh wait late to get the stoppage against gardner i think it would in 20th round but yeah he certainly fought um a lot of good fighters mike shrek um and you know he, he had a really good career fighting across multiple weights nearly 120 fights i think he had in total so about 118 119 fights so yeah very good fighter Yeah, I thought he's someone who goes underrated. I mean, he's completely anonymous today, other than a couple, some select channels like yours, Bo, and Scrapbooks. So, where does that bring us to? Is it, are we at Scraps number? Oh, we're back to you, Bo. Are we? Yes. Uh, which one do I want to highlight next? Well, actually, I'll jump back down to lightweight, um, and specifically in the nineteen twenties. Okay. Um, the next fight that I'll highlight. Okay, I'm not highlighting him mainly due to his resume even though he has a good resume um it is actually my top rated french born boxer of all time okay and he was known as the french flash which kind of gives you an indication of what kind of a fighter he was now you know in boxing history you know everyone has opinions and everyone has thoughts but i would like to draw everybody's thoughts okay to a fighter who knows lightweights really really well okay the great trainer ray arcel of course, who had the connection with Roberto Duran and the connection um, with Benny Leonard, two lightweights Ray Arcel trained. Now, what a lot of people don't know about Benny Valger um, is that he actually trained and sparred quite a lot 
with Benny Leonard himself. Okay, and when you're thinking about a fighter, he was a very quick footed, quick handed fighter, a master boxer. In fact, to quote Ray Arcel, you know, Benny Valger could match pretty much Benny Leonard punch for punch. He could match him in boxing IQ, skill, speed, everything. Um, Ray Arcel said the only handicap that Benny Valger had um, in terms of matched against Benny Leonard, he didn't have Benny Leonard's concussive knockout power. OK, uh, which obviously hurt him in some fights. Now, I mentioned Sid Terris um, and I said that Sid Terris had beat one of the other guys. And it is Benny Valger who Sid Terris beat. And if I remember, it were in front of a 14,000 crowd. And actually, Sid uh, Benny Valger said after that fight, uh, I've never fought a fighter with as quick hands as that. Um, you know, showing how fast Sid Terris punched when Benny Valger was recognised as having really quick hands. Um, but Benny Valger in his career fought a whole number of good fighters. He defeated former coloured lightweight champion Leo Johnson. Um, you know, he defeated him a few times. He also defeated future great bantamweight Joe Lynch. OK, he also defeated all of famer George K.O. Cheney, won at one punch knockout men of his time. And also in 1920, it has to be said, he defeated the current reigning lineal Long-time lineal featherweight champion, okay, um, in a non-title fight, Johnny Kilbane. And through his career, he also fought so many other good contenders like Frankie Britt, Joe Tiplitz. You know, the names go on. He also defeated a great UK fighter who very rarely gets a shout-out and nearly got onto my list, um, the great Charlie White himself, um, you know, who I call great uh, because compared to many UK fighters, he is great. Uh, Valger also defeated fighters like uh, former super featherweight champion um, Jack Bernstein. And again, a bit like... Um, you know, um, Sid Terry, Benny Valger couldn't rely on his knockout power, you know, so basically his skill set was that of a master boxer. He would box and pepper you with punches and move. He had quick hands, quick reflexes. Um, like Ray Arcel said, he could pretty much match Benny Leonard in skill, everything, IQ. The only thing he couldn't match um, is that punch power, that ferocious punch power Benny Leonard had. Um, but during his career, he fought a diverse set of fighters, um, you know, like Hilario Martinez, a former contender, just on and on and on and on and on. He fought fighters from all kind of backgrounds, Severio Tullierello, even top 10 rated fighters, former contenders like Johnny Cuthbert. You know, just a, a large resume. He, of course, was defeated by Sid Terris. He also was defeated by Billy Wallace. Um, but also gained a win over future lightweight champion of the lightweight tournament, Jimmy Goodrich, who was a very tough, capable lightweight fighter who won that tournament, becoming champion in the 1920s. So, you know, um, yeah, Benny Valger, less for his resume, even though he has a good resume, he fought over 2,000 professional career rounds. And if you think about that, he fought over 2,000 um, career rounds in his career. And he had a career of well over 200 fights with nearly 170 wins alone. Um, so, yeah, incredible fighter. Benny Valger, the French flash um, my number one rated French fighter is my next pick. Oh, that's a good one. We're digging deep, folks. We're going deep into the streets. So that I think that brings us to scrapbooks. Number three, scrapbook. Breakdown. I learned about Benny Valjo when I was about 15 years old. You hear me talk about Teddy. He was a old timer when I met him, Jewish uh, ex-fighter, and he lived on Cherry Street, Low East Side. He told me about Benny Valger. He said the difference between him and Leonard, Leonard was champion. He said Benny Valger was a hell of a fighter. You talk about underrated. It's a perfect segue until when you talk about fighters who are underrated, he is the guy. Um, a lot of people don't know about Benny Valger. But he was an outstanding fighter. So I'm very glad you put him on the list, BL, because a lot of people don't know who Benny Valdez is. He was something else. Very good fighter, a uh, good French fighter. Um, my yeah, thank you, Scrubs. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The next man I have on the list is Mike Gibbons, St. Paul Phantom. Mike Gibbons. Yeah. Was Oh, absolutely. He was an older brother of Tommy Gibbons. Tommy Gibbons only had like four to five losses, and he was in there with everyone. But Mike Gibbons is such an underrated middleweight. He came during the time of Jimmy Clabby and the Bayonne Globetrotter, Jeff Smith. He fought. Mike Gibbons was such an outstanding fighter. 
he was claimed as middleweight champion when Stanley Ketchum died in 1909. And you had so many men during that time, a cluster of middleweights who were trying to fight for that claim, to be claimed as middleweight champion. And of course, uh, Billy Papke wind up being on top. He wound up getting the championship back again. But Mike Gibbons was in the ring with everybody. He was in the ring with Harry Greb. He was in the ring with Jimmy Clapper, who Jimmy Clapper was called the Indian Wasp. And he had so many titles <laughs> in different weight divisions. He's a remarkable fighter. You could put him on his list as well. But Mike Gibbons was a tremendous fighter. I had to put him on a list because a lot of people just don't know who Mike Gibbons is. Now, obviously, those who study boxing know and appreciate Mike Gibbons. But those in the, you know, the guys who don't really understand boxing as they should, I'm not going to tell you anything about Mike Gibbons. But Mike Gibbons was a hell of a fighter. And I just wanted to add him because he deserves to be there for sure. Yes, yeah, Scrap, I, I I think, I mean, just just these names here, it'd be Jeff Smith, Leo Hook, okay, Ted Kid Lewis, Jack Dillon, Harry Greb, Mike O'Dowd. I mean, those six names to beat alone, not counting, you know, all the other fighters to beat. He were unbeaten against George Chip. He were unbeaten against Jack Dillon in two fights. He were unbeaten against Leo Hook. He beat Bob Moha. He were unbeaten in two fights with Willie Lewis. He had a four-fight series with excellent fighter Jimmy Clabby, who to me should be in the hall. He also had a trilogy with Eddie McGarty. Um, he, he, of course, defeated Harry Greb and then was unbeaten until Harry Greb got that revenge win in 1919 and over that um run from when he defeated greb he also defeated chip dylan you know frank mantel soldier barfield leo hook just an incredible fighter yeah. Um, you know, as well. yeah yeah and uh also because uh, a lot of people rate tommy gibbons very highly but tommy gibbons always said that he couldn't fight as well as mike mike was the better fighter and actually i i remember reading newspaper articles back in the day i were doing a lot of research on mike gibbons and a number of writers voted him as one of if not the best fighter in the world in those late teen years um, before Harry Greb really took off you know from like 1918 through but a number of people rated Mike Gibbons so highly they rated him as literally one of the best fighters in the world across all divisions that's very high praise in that era absolutely Yeah, good stuff. So, all right. So I've managed to confuse myself. So where are we at now? It's your third it's one, random buddy. My third one. So who was I going to go with for my third one? Who do I got left? Who do I got left on the list? So this is one of your favorite fighters, BL. So I'm actually going to ask you to join me in celebrating this fighter. because you know You know his career in more detail than me, and I couldn't find all the graphics i made for his career his fights in his career and those are my notes they i usually have my notes on screen but i want to talk Who about it ed gumbo smith oh ed smith <laughs> in fact i would like to invite you bl my friend to just because i learned about him through your channel and and then i've also I, also since i heard about him on scrapbook's channel and i've looked at his career you know because he relates sam langford because he was one of only two losses langford got uh 1913 and then the revenge beating the gumbo took in 1914 although his career was far from over and he was still considered a top guy for a long time he thought it was career changing and it led to a booking with someone else i'm going to talk about one of my other shout outs so anyway i would like to invite you to rant on gunboat smith as you love to do and then i'm going to add to it how's that sound well first of all i will say to ed, ed smith okay my man ed smith okay um you are talking about a guy who had well over 20 hall of fame fights okay now one one underrated thing about ed smith gunboat smith is he was actually quite a good boxer okay ed smith had 
a good jab. He threw a good straight right hand. Uh, he was a very economical puncher. Didn't waste a lot of punches. He used to fight at like a mid to long range. Looked to hit you with single shots and time punches on you. Very economical. Didn't waste a lot of energy. Was a very good rising contender. Now, he was maneuvering in position to challenge Jack Johnson, okay, for the world heavyweight title. Sadly, he suffered a DQ loss to Georges Carpentier, okay, that was in 1914. Um, and that kind of scuppered um, his chances of getting that Jack Johnson fight, okay, because Johnson would lose, of course, the following year um, to the giant Jess Willard. But Gumbo Smith fought Hall of Famers, okay, across years from 1913 to 1921, okay, he fought the two greatest heavyweights of the 20s in my book, Harry Wills and Jack Dempsey. Yes, he lost to them both. He fought them later on in his career, but he still fought them. He fought most of the great light heavyweights of that period. Okay, um, Sam Langford, Battling Levinsky, Georges Carpentier, Jack Dillon, Kid Norfolk. Okay, he also fought the great Billy Misk. Okay, he also fought middleweight like Leo Florian Hook, okay, who I will get on to later. Now, after beating Jess Willard, okay, in 1913, who would then go on to defeat Jack Johnson in 1915, taking his title, uh, Gumbo Smith also holds a win over Sam Langford in 1913. Um, he then defeats Jack Blackburn into 1914, but then suffers that DQ loss to Carpentier, which derailed him. He never really um, kind of recovered properly from that. He was always, you know, his, his kind of form became more indifferent. But he did fight, okay, a lot of good fighters, even good fighters like Bombardier, Billy Wells. He fought F Flyman Jim Flynn two times. He fought, you know, Sam Langford, Jack Blackburn, heavyweights, coloured heavyweight champions like Big Bill Tate, Harry Wills, you know, even fighting Big Tom Carroller, you know, Willie Meehan. Um, just the names go on and on and on. Billy Misko, I've mentioned, Clay Turner, Kid Norfolk, you know, a trilogy of defeats to Jack Dillon. I think that... Um, all in all, Gumbo Smith was a fighter who would just fight anybody. You know, he fought on way past his time. He's lost to Harry Greb was later in his career. Um, but he was a real, real fighter who would pretty much fight almost anybody. And indeed, did fight almost anybody. Even fighting, you know, young Peter Jackson. You know, even fighting earlier punchers like Mexican Pete Everett. Contenders like Al Kubiak. You know, even fighting... You know, Charlie Weiner, okay, would go on to be a top 10 and top 3 rated contender in his career. Uh, the giant Fred Fulton two times, okay, the massive puncher Fred Fulton. Um, now, Gumbo Smith had stand about six foot two and a half, so he was a decent sized heavyweight for his time. Not as big as some other giants like Bill Tate and Fred Fulton, etc, etc, and George Godfrey. But yeah, a very, very good heavyweight fighter. Um, not one of the elite heavyweights. Um, but a fighter who certainly pretty much fought everybody of everybody across his career. Oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, you did most of the you, you did most of the work for me. No, that was great. I knew I knew picking him because he wasn't on the on the list that you sent me the initial ten of which you would probably do five. But uh, I was like, wow, neither of us had gunboat, so I had to just I had to just throw him in there. So I did a last minute graphic from your excellent stat books, folks. Go to boxinglibrarian dot com. In fact, BL, do the shout out your own stat book thing real quick. Oh, my stat books are gone off my website. Sadly, my the website where I was selling them um, got bought out by another company, and they announced the closure of the website where I was selling them. So. Yeah, I'm a bit um, derailed on that at the moment. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, I, I did do over 250 stat books. So enjoyed doing them, uh, you know. But, yeah, it was, it was sad when website was sold because I were going I were ready for doing even more. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those things. But on my website over the coming months, I will cover Gumbo Smith and Mike Shrek and many of these fighters um, that we're talking about on video. Um, and there are links to all these fighters career videos on my website as um you know they are added in there so people can always access that access that at any time awesome yeah so if if the status changes on the scrap on the uh the stat books if they're available again we'll do maybe we do a live stream i'll certainly put something up on my channel because they are awesome and that's where i'm sourcing parts of these graphics from so those are actually from the stat books Gumbo well, actually, started. if I may, before we go on, I, I yeah. have still not forgot. I have still not forgot about a project I want to do. Uh, I won't show anybody the image, but the BL Big Book of Boxing starts maybe on the way. Um, 
one cover in each period um, with up to 100 fighters covered in each book. So that is a plan I'm working on for when my career videos slow down a bit. And th them books are going to dwarf me stat books. They're going to be something else. Oh, that would be amazing. BL's big book of stats. That's sweet. Exclusive. BL's big book of boxing stats. <laughs> Fantastic. <Catching him. laughs> oh, that's awesome. Can't wait for that to happen. Yeah, that's that's sweet. So to circle back to Gumbo, so look, he, he's he's someone who can't he was fighting in a time when you've got one you've got one championship available to him because he's a white guy. So okay. Well also okay, no, I take that back. Because there was a white heavyweight championship claim that sprang up. So I guess he has two titles available to him at, at times at least. But Jack Johnson's the champ. Gumbo's doing really well. You know, but when he hits his form, like Biel was saying, when he hits his proper form, so like 1913, you know, gets a couple wins over George Bohr, Rodell, beats future champ Jess Willard, beats Carl Morris, who was another guy who was considered, like these are guys who are like among the handful who Johnson's going to pick an opponent from. Johnson's hardly fighting at this time. So, you know, he kind of peaked in a year when he couldn't get, it wasn't going to happen for him. But uh, but beating Langford, you know, using his jab, like you mentioned his jab, BL, Gumboat had a great jab. He kept Langford on the edge, on the end of his jab. You know, people were trying to say it was a, it was a setup or Langford, and Langford, but Langford apparently he acknowledged that he just got bested that night. But when they rematched in 1914, Langford put it on him. I mean, really put it on him. It was one of the times when Langford abandoned the possibility of future money and just threw himself. There was other examples. Uh, a fighter who I know you're going to be talking about, BL, had an encounter like that with Sam Langford because he, uh, he said something about him being no longer in, in the top of the top. And so Langford just basically, who was known to sort of sometimes not go all out because, hey, if you go the distance and you can get a good purse from another club in a different city to see, but if you blow someone out, like the Mike Shrek fight, that's what happened when Langford really un unloaded on somebody. That was years oh, earlier. Oh, he destroyed Shrek brutally. Yeah, he, he beat he him so bad. He Shrek and battered him and took him out quick. Yeah, literally two weeks later after that, he was supposed to fight a club. Uh, I, don't, I think it was a new club applied for a permit to have him, Langford, fight Montana Jack Sullivan, who's a tough guy. He'd already had, he had like 20-something fights already at least, had a win over Flynn. And the Pittsburgh Public Safety Commission nixed the fight. It was that's how bad he put it on. So Langford didn't always do that because one, it cost him future money, and two, it had caused him problems. But and he he didn't claim that that was happening. He didn't acknowledge that it happened in the thirteen. Gunboat was just really damn good. But in fourteen, Langford came in in superb shape at the Armory in Boston, and Gunboat later said that fight ruined him. Yep, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he said later. You know, sometimes people, you know, they reminisce differently than they might have felt at the time. I don't know, but but certainly Gunboat wasn't through. In fact, later when Dempsey was in sort of playing games, I'm pretty sure he wanted Harry Greb. B.O., you can second me on this. Didn't he want Harry Greb to beat Gunboat to get a title shot? And then Greb mowed Gunboat down and he still didn't get a title shot. That's what I see yeah, Greb were never getting that title shot. Uh, I think Dempsey and his management team made it clear. Even though I had it, Greb said he knew that if Dempsey caught him clean, he could be in trouble. But he said, I'm confident I'll whip him every round and I'll outspeed him and he, he'll never beat me on points. So, but yeah, he wouldn't have got that. Even though he did take out Gumbo, he, he, he didn't get the shot anyway, like you yeah. said. Because I think I came across that in the papers, looking up, you know, the, the dynamic between like Harry Wills and Tommy Gibbons and Harry Greb and Jack Dempsey, like the, the Dempsey had a lot of great fights possible for him, but he wasn't fighting very often as champ. And then he got very inactive. You know, he started living the good life. But so, typical, typical Greb, by the way, he, di he didn't get any kind of shot against Dempsey. But, you know, in that time, he said, well, I'll fight Carponte and Seeky instead. Just like that. Yeah, well, it's almost like Langford, you know, when he was being avoided by especially after the, the Mike Shrek fight, the middleweights, the, the, with very few exceptions, fighters of his own size, especially the, the, the white fighters, 
they didn't want any part of him because look because that's what happened that was one of the it wasn't the only one but i i feel like the shrek win was one of those times when langford might have been like oh man now what now look what i've done now it's like pittsburgh's almost hostile to, i don't know if he even fought in pittsburgh again or in the in the near future or ever again but anyway it's like you know it's a difficult time but uh gunboat certainly earned that win he beat jess willard gumbo was considered one of those guys but then you know this was like title inactive champion you know and after johnson lost to willard that got worse willard was i don't want to say useless i don't want to be demeaning to anyone but he barely i think he just fought frank moran was that it he fought frank moran and no one else in those years was it moran yeah so yeah i believe so man I'm but these all these oh, sorry, heavy weights, on mute. oh it's okay all these heavyweights that are fighting busy schedules if the champ isn't doing anything then you know so he never became champ but he beat our all of us have sam langford as the greatest fighter of all time and 1914 sam langford was a top tier heavyweight i've seen big articles where they're talking about you know they were concerned certain writers were concerned that jack johnson would retire unbeaten and basically take that claim because Jeffries had come back. So that lineage was still intact. And so they were doing write ups on who might be the thing. And they, and it, it's funny going into the Jess Willard, Jack Johnson fight. They were basically certain writers, more than one writer was saying, uh, in major papers was saying like, you know, if Willard can't do it, Johnson's going to retire. And then the, the white race doesn't have the claim, you know, then it's like, sort of like put an emphasis on all that. In, insecurity that had been exposed by jack johnson's title reign because people say like oh cavorting around with women blah 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 you know a lot of these guys were knuckleheads a lot of these top boxes fighters are fighters a lot of these high-risk individuals are also kind of rowdy ketchell was a wild one but they didn't you don't see them making fun of him and, and doing it the way it was with johnson it was a racial thing racial insecurity Kid McCoy, they when he got he got married for the second time, and they were like, "Oh, here's his new wife." Blah blah blah. He was crazy too. You know, these guys. So it was very selective. So when people say like Johnson was too flamboyant, so he wasn't the only guy. It's just that he was one of the guys making the most money, so he could live it up. He could afford the race cars and things like that. But Ketchel was a wild one too, and so, you know, that's unfortunate about the way the sport was covered because it gives the wrong impression. That was the, it was designed to give the wrong impression, but Gunboat was a guy who did get in there with Sam Langford. So unlike Jack Johnson, Gunboat would fight Sam Langford, not just that, but after he beat him, he would fight him again. He wouldn't just take that win and ride off into the sunset, which is kind of what Johnson did with Langford. So Gunboat definitely deserves a lot of praise. And uh, I had to shout him out. One of us had to do it, BL. So when you sent me your revised list, I was like, all right, I'm doing Gunboat. <laughs> so serious yeah. guy deserves a, lot, deserves a lot of credit. He just peaked at a time when he couldn't get at a title shot. Because what was Jack Johnson doing in 1913? He fought battling Jim Johnson in Paris, and that's it. So that's it. So if you're not if you're not like a, a better fight for, and you know, it was you know, it's just a tough thing because it was complicated because Johnson was going through a lot of stuff, but. It's just that the, the way the the way people clamped down on Jack Johnson wasn't the way they treated these other knuckleheads. I mean, when I say knuckleheads, I just mean people who are rowdy. Or like Johnson was very fiercely intelligent, but he was also like, you know, fighters aren't like timid, right? So, so and Johnson was fearless. So a lot of these guys, like outside of boxing, they would sometimes had some a wild time. Jim Barry, who fought everybody but fought sam langford a million times uh you know he got, he got shot to death over a gambling debt i believe the day after what was it the day after he fought sam mcveigh was it in panama oh i can't quite remember but jim barry fearless montana cowboy fearless lived that way so you know it's just how it, it's just how it goes like it's a it's a crazy time so the way people have remembered you know, Gumbo's not celebrated, but man, he's got some good wins. Find me someone else who has a win over Sam Langford at that time. That's a short list out of all the dozens and dozens and dozens of fights Langford had.
seriously, like from 1907 to 1914, it's a very short list. I'm going to get to one of the other people who's in that select club. Gunboat's in that club. Credit to Gunboat. Let's keep it moving. Who's next? Uh, well, I'm next, and I am going to my fighter number four. Now, I thought about how to announce this fighter um, before Random brings up the graphics. So I thought to myself, well, you know, they often you often hear in boxing, you know, you're only as great as the fighters you beat. Okay? Um, if you don't beat great fighters, you're not a great fighter. You know, we hear this all the time. This fighter has not beat great names. But how about if you have a resume like this and you still don't get respected by most people. So what I want to do to announce this fighter before I name him is just roll call the major fighters this guy beat. And I want people to listen to the names of, of who this guy beat. This guy beat Jack Britton. Okay. The first three time undisputed welterweight champion and a top 10 all time fighter in my rankings. He also defeated unbeaten in a fight run against the great puncher harry lewis defeated former middleweight champion and hall of famer frank klaus former light heavyweight champion and hall of famer battling levinsky okay won four fights against former middleweight champion george chip defeated okay in a three fight series jack dylan former light heavyweight champion and hall of famer defeated billy papke former light heavyweight champ defeated billy papke former middleweight champ and hall of famer defeated johnny wilson former middleweight champion lost a three fight series to harry greb later in his career lost to gene tunney twice later in his career lost twice to mike gibbons for a draw with the great Jeff Smith, Jerome Jeffords, okay? Um, and if all that isn't enough, he also defeated Eddie McGorty, okay, as well. And Eddie, Eddie McGorty was like a tank. He was a powerful fighter. Also defeated Jimmy Gardner. Now, if all that there, okay, is not enough to earn him respect, he also fought a lot of other good fighters, okay, like Dick Nelson, the welterweight. He had a whole fight series winning a number of times with Young Lowry. Okay, he also fought good fighters like Young Otto, uh, defeating him, defeating Frank Mantel, fighting a fight series with Buck Kraus. Now, this is all to add, okay, to what is already done. And, you know, we've just been talking um, about Gumbo Smith. Uh, and one little lesser known fact is that this fighter actually fought um, Gumbo Smith and defeated him. He also defeated another very capable um, fighter of the time, Willie Meehan, also defeated excellent middleweight Jack McCarron, um, who never gets mentioned. Also defeated tough contender Clay Turner. And when you go down this guy's resume, well, I'll say the resume of Leo Florian Hook. Another important thing: people say you are you're as great as the fighters should be. Well, he has beat multiple Hall of Fame fighters, Leo Hook, uh, who were champions in multiple weight classes okay he has defeated multiple welterweight champions multiple middleweight champions multiple light heavyweight champions okay also defeated very capable fighters from lightweight you know and fought fighters up to heavyweight even defeating gumboat smith and willie mean willie mean gave dempsey trouble in their fight series willie mean had a very tough resume himself you know, um, he's, he's often laughed at, but Willie Meehan was a spoiler, a grappler. He could make you look bad. He wasn't an easy fighter. Yes, Greb beat me, and by staying on outside and peppering him with fast lightning combinations, you know, Greb was a, a lightning fast mover at that time. But, you know, he's defeated fighters who were even in my top 10 and fought fighters in my top 10 fighters of all time, like Gene Tunney, okay, like Jack Britton. He's defeated great underrated fighters, you know, like um, Jack Dillon. Battling Levinsky as well. He had a whole five fight series with him, defeating the underrated Harry Lewis. So when you think about all those opponents to be, and then factor, this guy came from flyweight. Okay. He was not a welterweight fighting all the way up to heavyweight, fighting multiple, multiple top contenders, elite level fighters, champions, all of famous at welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight. He actually came from flyweight. And fought, even fought tough lightweights. You know, he even fought guys like uh, Kid Beebe, okay, who could be a real handful. He had hundreds of fights. He, he's insane fighter. He even fought decent, well-decent fighters like Grover Hayes, you know, Kid Lock, 
So it wasn't only all the major names they fought. It were fighters like Paddy Lavin, okay, who, again, was a very tough fighter. Young Ern, who I've covered on a career video. Leo Hook fought who's who of everybody, pretty much from bantamweight all the way to heavyweight. Um, yes, he didn't fight Jack Dempsey. And yes, he lost to Gene Tunney later in his career and lost three times to Addy Greb, all in Greb's record year um, of 1919. But to me, Leo Florian Hook, going from flyweight to heavyweight, defeating multiple Hall of Famers across multiple divisions, while building that incredible resume with all the other tough contenders added I've mentioned, you know, your Clay Turners, your Gumboat Smiths, your Willie Means, Young Earns, all these other fighters, uh, his resume is incredible. And it still, to this day, uh, does not register on my mind why a guy who had nearly 30 fights against Hall of Famers, he had 28 fights in total, okay? This guy had over 30 fights against world champions. You know, I'm pushing towards 40 fights against pound pound fighters. I still don't understand why this guy doesn't get more rated than he does because fans now are very quick to jump on Pacquiao and say, wow, you know, he titled at flyweight and came all the way to like middleweight. That's legendary. But they never give, you know, Leo Hook credit for going from flyweight and fighting a whole number of heavyweights, including defeating some heavyweight contenders. Incredible. If Leo Hook would have had a title or titled in a few of those divisions, he probably would have been remembered a bit more. But we also have to remember another thing, fighting fighters in their primes or fighting fighters at the top of their game. Many of these fighters were primed when he fought them. Fight, he fought many fighters, you know, like Frank Klaus, you know, um, like George Chip, you know, like Battling Levinsky. He defeated Battling Levinsky a number of times before Levinsky became the lineal light of weight champion, 1916, 1920. He fought a whole number of fighters defeating them who would go on to win world titles. He fought other fighters later than that, like Billy Papke, after they'd won a title. You know, he defeated Billy Papke as well. Uh, another of the incredible resume that he has. Um, but just that willingness to go across all those weights, looking for any big fights. And also, another thing to add to his incredible resume and the weight move was, he was a very game fighter. You know, Leo Hook didn't fight these bigger men um, by, you know, pot shotting and running around the ring and trying to stay out of range and trying to outspeed him and trying to stay out of way and not get hit. You know, he'd fight Jack Dillon, who was known as the Giant Slayer because he could he could defeat heavyweights with relative ease, former lineal light heavyweight champion, all time great fighter at light heavyweight. You know, he fought him and he, he was trying to push him back. He was fighting him in the pocket. He wasn't running away and saying, oh, no, I'll stay out of the way and just outspeed them. He was willing to go into that pocket and fight them man to man. And when you add that to the flyweight to heavyweight move and that incredible resume he has, uh, Leo Floddy and Hook were an automatic choice for me. Excellent. Stuff. That was remarkable. That was remarkable. Liam Florian Hook actually drew with my next fighter. He drew with him July 4th, 1918. Liam Florian Hook was such an underrated fighter in today's market. BLC oh, I know BLC. your next fight. It is scrap. 1918, you said the draw. Yeah, I know it is. Yeah. I won't say. I'll let you know. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah, Liam Florian Hook was something else. And People who don't really understand fighters from the past are not going to understand fighters like Leo Florian Hook because they don't study them. They take fighters like Leo Florian Hook and others for granted, Ed Gunbo Smith. But that was a, an amazing, amazing breakdown, and it was well needed and deserved. And I want to personally thank you, Bill, for that because it brings light to fighters like Leo Florian Hook. And he needs to be recognized more often by many other platforms. So Yeah, thank, thank you, you for that, Scrap. And I will say, if I may say, Random, um, when, I, when I begin the next period of videos, when I've finished 18, 19, 19, 10, Leo Hook will be covered in a video. And to anybody who catches that video and sees the breakdown so of the main opponents and his record against them, you are going to marvel at just how massive Leo Hook's resume is and how many great wins he had. Incredible fighter. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Great job, Yeah. Thank you, Scrap. 
So I think we're down to your next one, Scrapbook? Yes, yes. BL knows exactly who this man is. This oh, man I do. Is... You know I rate him, Scrap. You know I rate him massively. Absolutely. He's a middleweight who, if you look at the top 10 middleweights, there's no reason why this man's name shouldn't be there. He, sh- he belongs in the names of Mike Gibbons and Harry Grab. And his name is Jeff Smith, the big old globe trotter. Why I put him on my list? The question, the better question would be why not? He was in a ring with Gene Tunney. Gene Tunney was the America's light heavyweight champion. Gene Tunney was boxing these guys' ears off in 1919 when he fought the AEF, America's Expeditionary Forces. And at that time, that was the same year when Jack Dempsey had obliterated Jess Willard to become the heavyweight champion of the world. Well, Leo Florian Hook and others were part of the era where fighters were fighters. And Jeff Smith was no exception. He sparred with Johnny Wilson. See, because all those guys lived in Harlem, New York. And Jeff Smith had relocated eventually to New Jersey. But Jeff Smith was a beautiful, beautiful boxer. He was in the ring with fighters like uh, Les Darcy, Frank Moody, George Robinson, Jamaica Kidd, Lee Anderson. Lee Anderson was a colored light heavyweight champion out of Harlem. He could punch. As a matter of fact, when Lee Anderson took on Kid Norfolk, Kid Norfolk suffered eye damage from Lee Anderson. And this was right before Kid Norfolk had damaged the eye of Harry Grab. So you're talking about a group of men during that era who were very tough, very rugged, very strong. They fought for a different purpose. And Jeff Smith was in the ring with Harry Grip seven times. He was a type of fighter who was very intelligent, but at the same time, if you wanted to stand with, stand in there with him, he was standing in there with you. And you had a whole fleet of fighters like that. But Jeff Smith, I mean, Tommy Lachlan, who was the big on, no, he was the um, Philadelphia Phantom. Philly Phantom. He was an outstanding light heavyweight champion. In fact, Tommy Lachlan was the first fighter after Gene Tunney had relinquished his title in 28 after he took on a magnificent heavyweight called The Rock. Tommy Lachlan took on the Boston Club. And that was Jack Sharkey. And that's what started the tournament off to get Gene Tunney's title recognized as the heavyweight championship title. Tommy Lockwood moved up from light heavyweight to heavyweight to enter that tournament. So these are the kind of men that Jeff Smith was in the ring with. Bob Roper and, and many, many others. So Jeff Smith, the Bay on Globe Trotter, is very underrated. But to me, he's in the top 10 of the greatest middleweights of all times, whether he was champion or not. I mean, he was in there with Jeff, uh, with uh, Les Darcy for the Australian heavyweight championship title. And he really, really meant a great deal to that era. He really did. So I have to shout out Jeff Smith, the Bayonne Globetrotter. Bill, what do you have on him? 
Well, Scrap, I'd, I'd just like to add, yeah, yeah, great stuff, Scrap. A, a great choice as well. I've, as you know, on um, my YouTube channel, I've often highlighted Jeff Smith uh, as well as Leo Hook and certain other fighters um, because they are very undeserving. And that writer who coined that phrase, Jeff Smith, is not only a great middleweight in his time, he could have won a middleweight title in any era. He was that good. In fact, even had he grabbed himself, um, once said in an interview that probably one of the most difficult fighters to fight yes. on his best day is Jeff Smith. Yes. Now, I believe Gene Tunney issued a same sentiment. And, you know, we're talking about a fighter who, you know, like you mentioned before, Jamaica Kid, he also fought very tough uh, former coloured middleweight champion, Panama Joe Gans. Yes. Uh, he yes. wasn't adverse to fighting black fighters. He also fought light heavyweights. He defeated Mike Gibbons. Uh, he defeated Jimmy Clabby. Um, and George Chip, who, of course, would win the middleweight title that Jeff Smith would never capture. Uh, like you said, Scrapbook, he fought for Australian middleweight title, which some people argue at one point was actually probably more valid due to Ketchell's death. And the fighters like Clabby, Darcy, Jeff Smith, who were fighting for, at one point, they said it's actually more valid than the middleweight title if someone won it, because the better fighters are fighting for that one, uh, which is an argument that would have gone down forever had it uh, come to pass that they were called world champion due to that. But even fighting many other good fighters, because he fought as well, the excellent Jack McCarron. You know, he also fought yes. tough fighters like Jackie Clark, you know, like you mentioned, Bob Roper, Clay Turner, he defeated Tommy Loughran. And like you mentioned, he fought the very tough and rugged Lee Anderson, um, who, of course, would lose his coloured light if we title to um, the excellent Kid Norfolk. Kid so, Norfolk. yeah, definitely a fighter who's very, very underrated. Uh, even fighting fighters like Young Ahern, uh, Mike Glover, former welterweight champion, Willie Lewis, a tough contender. Yeah, just an incredible choice, Scrapbook. Uh, I couldn't have chose better myself. Very deserving of uh, more respect. Yeah, and he was in the ring with Mike Mateague. Mike Mateague was the light heavyweight champion. He yeah, he defeated him twice, didn't he? Yes, he did. Mm. Yes, he did. Michael Dow, who was a middleweight champion. He was in the ring with Faye Kaiser, who was in the ring with Harry Greb nine times. Faye Kaiser was part of the AEF America's Expeditionary Forces. And Faye Kaiser, a lot of people don't know that Faye Kaiser was such... I mean, he, he was the kind of guy who would turn it on and turn it off anytime he felt like it. He was that good of a fighter. But Jeff Smith was in the ring with Faye Kaiser. I mean, everybody who you can think of. See, during that time when Stanley Ketchum passed away in 09, in uh, 1910, excuse me. And when Stanley Ketchum passed away, everybody during that time who were middleweights and light heavyweights was trying to get a hold of that title. And these are the men you had to surpass. But Billy Papke wind up, you know, becoming that middleweight champion once again. But Jeff Smith was not too far behind. So Jeff Smith, such an underrated man. I don't know why he's so underrated, BL, but this man was something else. He was a hell of a fighter. And those who study the game know who Jeff Smith is, and they all praise him very highly. Very good fighter was Jeff Smith. Yeah, yeah, I'll just add quickly to that scrap as well. Scrap will know this as I do. One of one of Jess Smith's main strengths in a ring was he was very versatile. Um Jeff Smith could be aggressive. Okay, it 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 throw com it come it move into you. It throw combinations. It work body. It work head. It mix it up. It try and get through your defenses to land his shots. Other times, it kind of go into a semi crouch. Okay, and he'd back off. And as you came in, he'd time fast, accurate, sharp punches as you came in, timing shots to tag you as you came in and close distance on him. So he was very versatile, very skilled. Uh, one of the fights with Greb. Um, Harry Greb actually um, got the win, but his face were pretty badly bust up. <laughs> yeah, Jeff Smith had bust his face up. Um, yes. And I, I think interviewer said something like, to Harry said something like, gee, Harry, you look like you've been, you've been hit by something. I can't remember what he said. And he said, he, I think that's the interview where he said, yeah, I was hit by one of the best fighters in the world and one of the hardest fighters to beat. Uh, he said he said something like, I got the win, but I paid a price for it with my face. Because you know how yes, to go, we're just waiting down to earth. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I got the win, but I paid the price for it on my face, he said, or something like that. So, yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he did. yeah, he was in the ring with Zulu Kid. Zulu Kid. I mean, Zulu Kid is another underrated guy that a lot of people don't know who he is. He was in the he, ring with Harry Grab and many of them. Yeah, he also, uh, Jeff Smith as well, also for, um, you'll know this guy, Scrap, uh, former coloured middle champ, Eddie Palmer. He also yes. uh, fought him as well. 
Yes, yes. Eddie McCarthy. I mean, so many great ones he was in the ring with. My God. Amazing, amazing fighter with amazing career he had. For sure. He, even, as well. Yeah, George Carponte and even good light heavyweight contenders in 20s like George Manley, Cuban Bobby Brown. Yes, you know, I mean, yes. Chuck Wiggins, he, he fought kind of yes. everybody. Yes, Cuban Bobby Brown was out of Philadelphia. Another very good fighter. I mean, you're talking about men who at that time were, they were the main focal point of what this game really represents during that era. And Jeff Smith was a part of that. So, uh, yeah, 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 I mean, I can't say enough about this man. He was something else. Yes, yeah, Scrap, I want to pick up on a great point you've just made there. You know, the 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 highlighting how these guys fought everybody across multiple divisions that the built resume is fighting everybody like you've mentioned jeff smith you know um i mentioned leo florian hook uh randoms mentioned all the fighters we've mentioned generally will fight anybody of anybody across multiple weights in sometimes massive fight series and like you said they kind of showed how good they are. Not like a fighter now who's fought a few average contenders and people are calling him great. You know, these guys did fight all the great fighters in the time for the most part, showing how good they were. And even if they didn't win, you know, they often gave them battles, like you mentioned. Um, to Gene Tunney. Gene Tunney said, Jeff Smith is an incredibly tough opponent. Uh, you know, just like Gene Tunney said about Tommy Locker and many of these fighters, even when they lose to these great fighters, they give very good accounts of, of themselves. Like Eddie Greb saying, yeah, I got the win, but I paid for it in my face. You know, um, they often gave these legendary fighters really, really tough fights and close fights. So, yeah, that's a great point you made. They proved how good they were by the level of opposition they fought. Yeah, and Biel, just to, just to piggyback on what you just said, when you look at names like Alabama Kid, when you look at Jimmy Clabby, when you look at uh, these kind of fighters, George Compartier, they all came up from very small weight divisions all the way up to as high as heavyweight. So you're, you're looking at a group of men who thought that way. I want all and every single contender that I can get my hands on. Harry Grip, all of them felt that way. So that era right there was very rich and very deserving of praise and, and what they have done during the time in which they came. You know, they didn't have cell phones. I mean, they, they, it was a whole different time, a whole different way of thinking for these guys. So these men were something else. They just were. I'd, al I'd also point out um, to many people who haven't had chance to study much boxing history. A lot of people um, criticize um, the kind of fights they had. Some people make out it was just sparring added to records. But what a lot of people don't realize is many of fighters, these fights, many of fights these fighters had were in front of crowds of thousands and thousands. You know, like I mentioned, um, when Sid Terry's beat Benny Valger, I think it were a 14,000 crowd. You know, when, when Greb fought Jack Dillon in second fight, thousands, thousands crowd. You know, yes. these fights were not small hall show fights. Many of them were fought in front of crowds of thousands. There were big events in the local cities where they happened at the time. Many of them had, you know, huge crowds. So that's another little misconception that some people have sometimes. Yeah, there were many what, what would be now called small hall shows. But also many of these fight fighters fought in stadiums, in fields with purpose-built rings. You know, yes. I mean, look at White City where, you know, Len Harvey fought in front of huge crowds. You know, um, it's just one of those things, a uh, misconception some people have. Absolutely. Absolutely. German Hall was another a, a place where a lot of these men fought. And these were spectacles during that time. I mean, these men were, were almost like like senators and, and governors. And, you know, that's how highly respected they were during that time. And when they came up and they came in your city to fight, you had to be there. It was the talk of the town. It was more than any other event, boxing during that time. And these are the type of men that we're trying to bring for you to understand how rich of a history this game was. Remarkable, remarkable time, 1920s. Yeah, well said, Scott, well said. Amazing. Well, well said. It is a remarkable time. Many of my top 10 greatest fighters of all time are from this period, uh, not later ones like Moore and Robinson and Armstrong, but a whole number of them are from 120-year period, 1910, 1930. 
So an incredible time and many incredible fighters who fought across the multiple divisions. So Jeff Smith, yeah, worthy entry, worthy. Oh, thank you. Very thank random. You. Me and Scrap had a bit of a geek out there and went on a tangent, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm enjoying this immensely. I'm here to learn. Well, did I hear someone say, try to fight everybody? I did. Y yes. So anyway. Oh. Strength of competition. Oh, man. There are people who fight a lot of good contenders. There are people who fight fair, their fair share of great fighters. There are people who fight Hall of Famers. And then there are people who fight all of that. And a lot of times in a long series. Definitely and then to, <laughs> to do that, to survive that, you need technique. You can't fight at the highest level get over and over again, along with a busy schedule in general, and not ruin your hands. Or get just punch drunk, you know. This fighter here was a technician. He had a crack. He could crack. He, I think he had about 70 knockouts in his career. But he was also technique-driven competitor. Great jab, long arms. He wasn't overly short, but he had long arms for his height. I think on box rec, they have him listed as 79-inch wingspan. I don't know how accurate that is. Sometimes, you know, reporting varies, and I haven't, like, looked into it specifically, researched the height. But uh, the Joplin ghost, Jeff Clark, this guy was awesome. It, But his record, and BL, you know, Scrapbook, you know. you One of you guys could probably guess I might have brought Clark up. Let me pull this up. Boom, boom, boom. These are from, again, from uh, BL's excellent stat books. Just just clipping them in there, but throwing it in. 130 wins. And I think about 70 of those were knockouts. You know, five wins over champions. Also five wins over Hall of Famers. His signature win, I would say, in 1914, Sam Langford fought a bunch of times, right? This was his comeback. Like, I'm back in shape. He got a little chunky in Australia, 1913, toward the end of the year. They were like, is Langford done? Is he past it? Because he came in a little bit heavy against Gumbo uh, and, and Jeanette. He didn't look that good. I think it was earlier in the year. Or it was one of the, these fights where they were questioning. But then at the end of the year, in 13, Langford closed out the year with a phenomenal in-shape performance, a classic against the great Joe Jeanette. That survives on film today. That's on YouTube. Their 10th fight. And so he was back. But 1914, he only lost one time. Who did he lose to? Guys, who did he lose to? That's right. The Joplin Ghost, Jeff Clark. This was a week after Sam Langford had given Gumbo Smith a career-changing beating, according to Gumbo. Jeff Clark, with the jabbing, with the moving, with the ring generalship, gets the win. That's a great win. It's a great fighter and an insane level of competition. Look at the stat. Look at I you I haven't been putting up opponents lost and drawn, but I did in this point in, in this graphic. Because you can also see who he lost to. Dixie Kid three times, Sam Langford five times. Yes, yeah, so like five right there is five losses, but he actually has wins over Sam Langford. And one of their draws, let me see if I can find my graphic here. Here's the series, if I'm not mistaken. But that one in, uh, it was either November 1st or October 31st in 1918 in Lowell, Massachusetts. Apparently, Clark deserved the win. The ref called it a draw after 12 rounds, but Clark actually got the best of the action. So a win in spirit. But that's just against Sam Lifer. That's just Jeff Clark against, the you know, the, the greatest. And, you know, the first time they met, he got absolutely blasted out. He barely escaped the first. He went out in the second. It wasn't close. But then he, between then, th and this is the difference. Hold on, let me see here. I don't think, I'm not sure which one that is, which one in their series that is. That's just getting both their faces up. Clark with Langford. Let me, I've got a couple of graphics here for Jeff Clark. Okay, here we go. 
So like he gets going, he's he's doing good. He loses, notably loses to Dixie Kid three times, another great fighter. You know, but you can see other than that, very few setbacks in a busy schedule. 1910, you see at the end of the year, he's he's do, look how busy he is in 1910. But at the very, to close out the year, he gets blasted to pieces by Sam Langford and then lose on points over 10 rounds to the great Joe Jeanette who is an all-time great. So he loses to two all-time greats. Yeah, Jeff Clark only lost seven fights in his first 100-plus fights. Right. You can see his 1911. You see Montana Jack Sullivan on that list? That was maybe a year. Actually, that's pretty close to a year after. Because I think... No, no, I'm sorry. Didn't... um. Let me think. When did Langford fight Shrek? Was it the end of 1910 or was it 1909? I forget. 1910? I'm thinking that this, this Jeff Clark fight with Montana Jack Sullivan in early 1911 might actually be the fight that Sullivan ended up having instead of fighting Langford. Can't be sure. But anyway, you can see the rebound. Don't call it a comeback. Look at that in 1911. So, yeah, he loses twice at the absolute all-time great level for, for these weights. But then he just goes back. And there are guys on that, there are guys on that list. But he's, he's – and you can see battling Levinsky on there. That's another so – he – I wanted to talk about Levinsky, but I, I wanted to get Shrek in there. Because there's only one Shrek in the general consciousness, and that is a cartoon. So, like, I have to throw Mike Shrek in. Otherwise, battling <laughs> Levinsky, another ridiculous <laughs> – you know what I mean? That. Sometimes you got to write it wrong, BL. That's what had to happen here. But is he done? No, he's like, he's he's already fought a ton of fights, a lot of them at a high level. And other than a setback... And look, at, to look at that three years, how few defeats he has, even though he had few defeats in all those first years. It's remarkable. Yeah, so when people go, oh, look at the record, that's why you can't count losses, because if you have all these fights, and if you keep... Like, there are great fighters like uh, Joe Frazier, right? I, I, I don't know if you know offhand his, his Hall of Fame record, but it's, it's not a giant Hall of Fame record. It's still a great fighter, but it's... So, like, when people count losses, it's like it's all relative to who they're fighting. Jeff Clark had so many fights against Hall of Famers. It was ridiculous. Wins and draws, like, fighting even means something at the, at the, at the all-time great level. If you fight even with a great fighter... Even if it's just in spirit, that's not a draw isn't a loss. Sorry, draw Random, I were, on, I were on mute. I were trying to t tell you, uh, Joe yeah. Fraser's Hall of Fame record is two win fall offs. Right. Great fighter. A lot of people would rate him very, very highly because he was very important. He, and his signature win is like, oh, my gosh. You know, his signature win is pe a lot of people consider one of the greatest wins of all time. So, yeah, understandable. But like Jeff Clark's Hall of Fame schedule alone is 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 absurd. But he's still going. We we haven't finished his career. So like, let me just rewind here. So he's doing good. Beats that, and you can see in nineteen oh eight, he beats the Irish giant Peter Maher. You know, and then beats him again in oh nine. Those are good wins. That was a serious dude with a ton of knockouts. You've done recent content on on him. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter Maher had over 90 knockouts in three rounds or less and over 100 knockouts in total. Yeah. And it, it's somewhat similar, although Jeff Clark, like, Maher fought like a ridiculous, a really tough schedule after he'd already had a lot of fights and knockouts. Like, he fought a very tough schedule when he came over to the U.S. And, and he didn't always have success, but but partly because he was jumping into such a rich texture and he was a, he was a big name, so... He got a lot of big fights. Uh, and he's another guy who might end up being underrated these days. But, you know, so Clark is fighting. He's fighting. He keeps going. So even with the setbacks line from Jeanette, Jeanette, look at the rest of that time in there. That's ridiculous. And Levinsky, that's a real serious uh, two wins. A really serious, I think both on points. Uh, one newspaper decision over 15 and one on points over 10. One other interesting... If I may, Random, one other interesting point about Jeff Clark. He fought fights against Hall of Famers, either one to six, depending on year, 
every single year from 1908, okay, into the 1920s, 1922, when he fought Harry Wills twice. He fought Hall of Fame fighters every year from 1908 to 1922. That's incredible. Yeah, like Langford, I, I, I checked. So Langford fought a, at least one Hall of Famer every year from 1903 to 1922. From Joe Gans, December 1903 to Tiger Flowers in 1922. Every year. Jeff Clark, yes. like you're saying, Jeff Clark, I, just it's not the kind of schedule where you can judge it. Just like you look at the key moments in other great fighters' careers at that Hall of Fame level when they're fighting greats. Yeah, you can't always win them. It's like it's unless you're very careful about stylistic matchups, but these guys didn't have that luxury. So he fought. Just like with Langford, like even after he got the win back over Langford, you know, there are other situations where people make a lot of money. They're like, yeah, I got that win. I'm leaving with that win. You'll never see me again. We're one on one, but I got the last win. No, they didn't have that luxury. They just so they got it on. You can say our last fights in 1921. So they fought in 1910 all the way through 1921. That's just one. One rivalry of Jeff Clark's. It's absolutely silly. And he had so many Hall of Fame fights. It's not like this one series, like not that it would tilt it to un unfair stat mining to the, the fact that it's a series against the greatest fighter of all time. But even if it wasn't, he had a lot of super high. If you remove the Sam Langford fights from Jeff Clark's career, he still had a great career. He still had a powerful career because he fought so much at the highest levels. And that kept going. Yeah, he's got. He's got nearly 40 Hall of Fame fights. I mean, that number itself is pure insanity. Uh, and he's not bettered, except for by a very few fighters in boxing history. Right. And he's just, I'm going to keep scrolling. Like, so he's coming through. Like, he's, it's like he's getting his thing together. Dixie Kid, I'm sure, taught him some lessons in, the, in those losses, those three losses. Then the hard lessons against Langford and Jeanette. But look, he's kicking so many butts outside of that. He's a, there's some, the momentum coming into it. I mean, this is a great run. It's just he's not in the TV era. It's a live gate era. There are all these clubs. So on the one hand, you have lots of opportunities to fight if your body can take it. You have the skill set to not ruin your hands or your brain. But on the other hand, you do so much, you don't always get the appropriate attention. So you have to do so much. You're not getting the money to have much of an option. He's still going. He's still going. Just to, give you, just to give people an idea, in 1910, um, Jeff Clark had more fights than he knew he has had professional fights his entire career. Jeff Clark had more fights in that one year than he knew he's had in his entire multi-year career. So that kind of shows the level he was fighting, the sheer amounts of fights. I'm not saying he's better or worse than he knew he. It's just pointing out how busy um, Jeff Clark was. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And because losses add up, but it's it look at the, we can look at the ratio. We can, if we have the opportunity to you to wield the information which the internet affords us now, you can see that it's the ratio of like success. You see this losing two twice in a row. Oh, should he retire? What do you mean retire? It's only nineteen it's only the end of nineteen ten season. Boom, nineteen eleven. Look at that. That's a turnaround, including Levinsky. That's a really good pair of wins. But he's still going. We got through to 1914. He's still going, undefeated in 1914. Just the one setback to uh, the great, the great Joe Jeanette, 1913. 1914, beat Sam Langford. Just that. That is a great win. That is a serious win. But he, look at all the work he put in from the Langford loss. He gets destroyed by Langford in, in Joplin. And then in, uh, he goes up to New Jersey and loses on points to Joe Jeanette. But like, look, look at all the work after that, 1911, 1912, 1913. So by 1914, man, he's so much a, an involved fighter. But he's packed in that experience. They don't really get that today. They try to simulate it with sparring and things. But it's just at this time, he just go kick a whole slew of butts, just beat up a whole bunch of people. Some of them are good. Some of them are trying to get into the game and they're looking to fight names. So if you're a name, you, you can just roll into town and beat a guy up who's not on your level. You're, it's still a risk you're taking because every now and again, some of these guys like 
Like Joe Gans probably thought he's going to roll into town and, you know, and school Sam Langford. That seems to have been what happened. And Sam Langford beat him. Langford had only been fighting like 20 months or something, which is crazy. So anyway, but he's still going. This is what I was saying. 15, 16, 17, two wins over Gunboat in 1917 in Panama. But he also fights twice against the great Sam McVeigh. So like we were saying, Gunboat, who was still a factor in 17, even if he wasn't necessarily at his peak anymore, but he also fights twice, lose on points over 20 rounds to the great two-handed punch in Sam McVeigh. Fantastic fight, a very adaptable heavyweight, as well as built like a tank. On the along the lines of Mike Tyson, with just a slightly less freakishly thick neck, he didn't quite have the same neck, but he was he was built. McVeigh had some legs on him too, man. He was a unit. He never skipped leg day. So 1917. So you know Clark goes 20 rounds with him, and then goes out in the 15th. I mean, I'm sorry, gets him in the 15th, and then lose the battling gym. And the great Harry Wills. That's just one year. 1917. Clark is past his prime. Look at that schedule. I would say he's maybe he's not quite past his prime. I'm not sure. Then, but and then you see that like a lot more losses come into the thing. But what's he doing? He's still fighting. He's still fighting a lot of times at the highest level because he's still really good. You know, it's, and his career peters out. It just it just happens. The the person's available change depending on recent successes. So eventually, these guys lose the opportunity, even if they're still willing. But. You know what a what a crazy career i've probably ranted long enough about the the joplin ghost here but i just want really 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 he was the only one i knew i was going to talk about when we decided the topic i was thinking you know what jeff clark you're going to get your shout out brother this you deserve this so this was my opportunity and also good shout out earlier to to george cole that's a photo i found in the paper that's one of my favorite things i ever saw in a newspaper archive I was like, look at George Cole in this magnificent sweater. Holy cow. Quick so job, anyway. Man. Yeah, yeah, great job, man. Yeah, so Jeff Clark, the Joplin Ghost, the fighting ghost of Joplin. What a great fighter. Jab, jab remover, very clever. You know, one of the fighters who really, really could get on his bike, but he could he lay some stuff in. You know, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien was a great fighter like that. And uh there are others, the great jabber movers. They give guys trouble because they were mobile, but they could get you while they're on the way out, on the way in. And Clark, as evidenced by his like at least like close to 70 knockouts in his career, you know, showed that he uh he had some crack to his punches. So he wasn't just uh some feather fisted, you know, dance instructor. He was he could still crack, he could still get a guy out of there. It's just he fought so many got times at the Hall of Fame level. Again, to reference the great Joe Frazier, you know, his, you know, like a lot of these great fighters versus great fighter matchups go the distance. Because they've got the reserves and they've got the cool headedness to to make it the length. So he fought a tremendous amount of rounds and fights, both against some of the greatest fighters ever among the heavier weight classes. So shout out to the Joplin Ghost, Jeff Clark. Very, very underrated. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Great job, Random. Oh, thanks, guys. So I think we are on my fifth one now, aren't we? Um, yeah, it's interesting. Know. My fifth one actually fought Jeff Clark. <laughs> uh, now, this guy, okay, was discovered. Okay, I think Scrapbook may figure out what I'm talking about. He was discovered, okay, and taken to Panama to fight um, during the building of the Panama Canal. Oh, yeah. uh, this guy was taken down there. Panama had a very a burgeoning fight scene at that time. He would fight local fighters. He would fight docksmen, uh, dockmen, construction workers. He would take whatever fights down there he could. Uh, the guy who took him down there thought, I can make a lot of money with this kid. This kid's ferocious. Uh, we're talking about a very hard puncher. Uh, goes underrated as being a hard puncher, um, but showed even against heavyweights um, that he certainly had knockout power and also showed uh, against Tiger Flowers a few times he had power as well. Yes, yes. Uh, 
and this guy is another guy who went from kind of middleweight where he first the main weights he fought at you know light heavyweight and heavyweight uh also fought at middleweight of course this fighter is one of the few fighters to defeat harry greb okay he fought harry greb twice winning one and losing one this guy stopped gumbo smith who was mentioned earlier by random in only two rounds okay as a middleweight this guy won and lost to the ghost of joplin jeff clark okay he beat gumbo smith a whole number of times this guy stopped tw tiger flowers inside the distance twice once in the <laughs> third round and i think the other was the first round okay yeah <laughs> so who am i talking about he also stopped jeff clark in two rounds and when you go on youtube and watch footage of this fantastic fighter one thing what you realize is when he's fighting big bill t he almost looks cartoonish because he looks so small okay and yet he's been aggressive he's fighting big bill t who were like six five six six okay kid norfolk okay is the fighter i'm talking about okay um william ward he was an outstanding fighter look at that physique people he was not only an incredible fighter he was also an incredible puncher you know knocking out gumbo smith in two rounds the ability of knocking out other heavyweights stopping jeff clark in two rounds while also knocking out middleweight greats like tiger flowers okay um winning the colored light of weight title against lee anderson fighting his entire fight series with jamaica kid former colored middleweight champion fighting and beating battling jim johnson who was up to a 240 pound heavyweight who stood six foot three tall okay <laughs> this guy fought everyone he defeated former powerhouse light heavyweight champion battling seeking 1923 on yes. points over 15 rounds you know the following year okay he also gained his win over harry greb this fighter okay kid norfolk also defeated one of the great fighters of his time billy misk okay billy misk who is a vastly underrated fighter kid norfolk held a win over billy misk i i marvel at kid norfolk because again i think it's like indicative of what we've spoke about with a number of fighters tonight if or anybody having a whole fight series with jeff clark fight series with middleweights like jamaica kid you know fighting greb more than once having a fight series with tiger flowers fighting light heavyweights you know lee anderson battling seeky you know even fighting older fighters jack blackburn you know the fight series i had and the fighters he fought and the fighters he beat it's an incredible list of names um you know even later on losing to fighters like ted moore was a very good contender tommy gibbons you know this guy fought a who's who of everybody i have such respect for kid norfolk i think he goes very very underrated um he beat great fighters across multiple weight divisions beat champions across multiple weight divisions had zero fear in fighting big men would fight big men even beat john lester johnson he beat other heavyweights it wasn't just like bill t jeff clark who he had a fight series against gumbo smith who he stopped in a few rounds he also fought other heavyweights as well so he would pretty much fight anybody put in front of him he would literally fight anybody put in front of him also had fights with laddie williams also had a fight series with clay turner okay including a knockout win over clay turner who was a very tough and rugged contender so to me kid norfolk is a fighter who definitely deserves more praise and i cannot wait to do his career video uh on my channel like many of fighters i will cover but yeah william ward he's a fantastic fighter the thing about it is what what again we know us three on the panel but some younger boxing fans may not know is that when he fought a guy who weighed over 200 pounds he wouldn't go up to 200 pounds he'd fight him at 165 170 and he'd fight a guy weighing 220 pounds he wouldn't care he would just fight them as they were he didn't moan and go on about the weight difference he didn't moan and go on about the size difference you know incredible fighter kid norfolk i can't really say no more other than if all every who's who of everybody from middleweight to everywhere yes he did lose to harry wills with that with that with that short jolting punch on inside when he were felled like a tree and people ringside were like well what punch did he we didn't see a punch you know because despite 
popular belief, Harry Wills could indeed punch on inside. Uh, yes, he was de defeated by Sam Langford. But when you've got knockout or stoppage wins over fighters like Jeff Clark and Tiger Flowers, Jack Blackburn and many others, when you've got wins against Billy Misk, you know, when you've fought great heavyweights like Joe Jeanette, you know, he also had a knockout win over Big Bill Tate. He was like 6'5". He was he were a huge guy. Uh, Kid Norfolk fought him a whole number of times. I, I just marvel at this fighter. Um, yeah, Kid Norfolk's my fifth um, underrated fighter. Wow, that's a great choice. Scrap, I'm sure you want to add to that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. BL, what a great breakdown, brother. What a great breakdown. Yeah. Um, this man here, him and Panama, Pan Panama um, Joe Gans had the same manager, Leo P. Flynn. And I can share some stories. I want to share two quick stories with you about Kit North. There was a man by the name of R.I.P. to him. His name was Ira Becker. He was the owner of Gleason's Gym when it was on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue in the Bronx, New York. He fought in the 1920s. He told me stories about Kit Norfolk. Now, he's there. There's no history book. He's telling me what happened. But I want to also tell you about the stories my grandfather told me. He was there. There's no books. He told me what happened. Kit Norfolk. You had Kid Norfolk, Lee Anderson. You had Tiger Flowers, Barbados Demon, Joe Walcott. You had so many of these men who used to hang around this club called the Supper Club. Jack Johnson owned the club. And at that particular time, you it was very difficult for black community to go into some of the clubs but jack johnson happened to own this club now kid uh, club deluxe was on the second floor and the supper club was on the first floor so these men used to hang out there all the time all these men that i mentioned to you you know how lee anderson and kid norfolk about got made right there in that club because they used to play CeeLo. Panama Joe Gans used to wear his hat to the side and he would shoot dice. He would squat down and shoot dice. These men didn't speak very well English at that time, but they made a wager that Kid Norfolk would be able to arm wrestle Panama Joe Gans. And whoever won that fight would have to take on Lee Anderson. Like I told you, Lee Anderson was feared in Harlem. So Kit Norfolk won the arm wrestling match, and Lee Anderson had to fight, had to take on Kit Norfolk. That's how that fight got made. <laughs> so it, it's amazing. You know, uh, Panama Joe Gans had lost his title to Larry Estridge, who I met. He's from the Bronx, New York. He was a southpaw, like um, Marvin Hagler. Ball head, five foot nine, very good fighter. All of these men hung out at the supper club. But when the supper club was taken over by Artie Madley, he, you know, uh, Jack Johnson was strong armed. He took the club away from him. Then they all hung out in Grubb's gym on 116th Street, and they would tell stories about the old days. But Kit Norford was a, an unbelievable fighter, unbelievable fighter. So. BL, great job putting him in the list. He's credited for accidentally thumbing Harry Greb in the eye, and Harry Greb from that point would have to fight 47 more bouts with basically one eye. But Kid Norfolk was something else. He really, really was. So I was glad and pleased to hear about Kid Norfolk being on this list. No, thank you, Scrap. And I'll say that very few fighters could fight Greb in a roughhouse brawl. Um, very few fighters had survived such a fight because Greb were a master fighter on inside. He were very good at hooking you with one arm, clubbing you with other, tying you up, being in position to punch when you couldn't. But Kid Norfolk showed in that second fight that he could fight just as dirty as Harry Greb and he could fight him inside yes. the pocket. He could match him for tactics. Uh, he showed that he was 
you know, on a certain level that he could fight Greg man to man, um, and and you know, not just get overpowered and outscored with ease. Um, and you know, when you factor the the larger fighters he fought, the great knockout wins he has, um, he's got over thirty knockouts in three rounds or less. I mean, he was a big puncher, you know, um, an underrated puncher, and all those fighters he fought. Yeah, I, I marvel at him. I can't wait to do his career videos and many career videos on fighters we've covered tonight. Oh, it sounds like a lot of fun. William Ward, yeah. My next fighter and last fighter is someone who I know BL has a lot of respect for. And his name is Obi Walker. Oh, yes, Obi Walker. Obi Walker, 1929, 1946. Those are his years in the ring. Now, I know we're going up to 40, but uh, from... 29 to 40, 46. Obi Walker was in the ring with Elmer Violent Ray 14 times. If you don't know who Elmer Violent Ray is, you got to look him up. I was going to put him, in fact, I had him on the list, but I removed him because I wanted to put Lynn Johnson in. But Obi Walker was something else. He was in the ring with fighters such as Tiger Henderson. He was a puncher. Leroy Hayes, another good fighter. Jack Tramiel, who I met. And uh, the only wish he had was to meet Mike Tyson. This is going back in the 80s. George Cook, he was out of New Jersey. Willie Reddish, out of Philadelphia. Willie Reddish was a trainer for Sonny Liston. He also trained Meldrick Taylor in the amateurs. He had George Godfrey, the Leaperville Shadow. Now, the reason why I'm naming some of these guys George Godfrey the Leaperville Shadow won his title from Larry Gans, 1926. It was a vacant title when Harry Wills was stripped of his title when he allegedly had, you know, hit low blows and excessive holding with Jack Sharkey. So his color heavyweight championship title, which he defended 25 times, he was a three-time color heavyweight champion. They stripped Harry Wills of his title. So George Godfrey Leaperville Shadow would take on Larry Gans. Larry Gans was out of Canada. Well, Obi Walker was in the ring with Al Walker, fought him three times. Bearcat Wright, fighter by the name of Larry Gans. Obi Walker was in there with some. Awesome fighters. During that time, you had Turkey Thompson. You had Wallace Cross. You had so many good heavyweights during that time. Harry Bobo. But when you look at fighters like Obi Walker, he is a quintessential underrated fighter because he would fight you. You catch him on a good night, as BL always says. He will give you hell. He was just one of them kind of guys. And if you don't understand a fighter like Obi Walker, do a little research on him. We talked about the Joplin Ghost, Jeff Clark. These are the type of fighters who on any given night will show up and give you problems. So Obi Walker I had to put on his list as my last fighter, and I think it's well-deserved. Actually, if I can jump in there, Scrap, I, I just a lot of few things to what Scrap said. I think Obi Walker is a very worthy name to be mentioned, and I think a lot of people um, who don't know much about Obi Walker don't realise eh, how tough he was, how hard he was, um, how he could absorb a punch, his strength. He, he was more squat, powerful built. Feared in Europe, he would throw short hooks, a la Joe Louis. He'd throw short hooks, and these shooks short hooks had tremendous force he could knock you out way either hand um and like scrap rightly said um i have mentioned it before he could be a fighter who could fluctuate in weight you know uh, he come in for one fight 242 42 it'd be a little bit more sluggish a little bit more still very dangerous you know some some you know, uh, writers back then said Obi Walker was two fighters. One, he was still a very hard fighter to beat at 240 pounds. But if he came in at 220 to 225, you, you had a major problem on your hands. He, he beat Tony Galento, beat Tony Galento. The fight series with Elmer Ray, 
and I don't mean beat as in he just won, I mean he beat Tony Galento. Um, the fight scenes with El Murray, some people scrapple know this, but people, some of those fights were so brutal. Okay, there was one fight where El Murray stopped and started going through the ropes. Okay, and the the, re yes. the referee said to him, "What are you doing? It's not the end of the fight." And he he, he said. There's been enough pain dealt in this ring tonight because okay. those two beat the, the bejeebas out of each other. It was said in that fight, they were hitting each other so hard, two massive knockout punches. El Murray was also a big, brutal puncher. They were smacking each other so hard, they were nearly turning each other's bodies with sheer force of blows they were in on each other. They That's were it. brutal fights. Sobey Walker was incredibly tough, hard to keep off. Uh, he was incredibly hard to hurt. Uh, he could knock you out with either hand. He was strong. Uh, I rate him very highly. And, of course, he was one of the last coloured heavyweight champions, you know, um, like That's Scrap right. said, following, following on from that time. Uh, he never got a shot at Joe Lewis. He never got a shot at certain other fighters uh, who he wanted to fight. Um, but, you know, Obi Walker was a major threat. I always likened him to a shorter version of Kimbo Slice, like a Kimbo Slice, but a bit shorter. Shorter arms, but tremendously powerful fighter. Very, very dangerous fighter indeed. Oh, well said. Well said. I just want to finish up on that. BL, well said. Well said. When he fought Elmer Violet Ray, Elmer Violet Ray got an opportunity to fight Jersey Joe Walcott. Jersey Joe Walcott defeated Elmer Violet Ray and got that shot with Joe Lewis in 1947. Elmer Violent Ray was a magnificent fighter, but Obi Walker, I, I wish he had an opportunity to get that shot as well. But man, I'm telling you, Obi Walker was something else, man. He really, really was. And a lot of people just don't understand, you know, a lot of these men during that time. But he was tough. He was also known as the black box car and the bear cat. You know, he, he was just, he was just a very strong, like a fire plug, very strong fighter, Obi Walker. And I, I, yes, Scott. Well said. And I think I think some people out there don't realize when we when we mention these names like uh, Violent Kid Elmer Ray, a lot of people don't realize Elmer Ray won and lost to Ezard Charles. Yes, he was a high quality fighter. So Obi Walker having this more than brutal fight series with him, where they both won some of those fights that were brutal. They are both big brutal knockout punches. I would love to have that in fa entire fight series on on Blu-ray if I could or DVD. I mean, you would be entertained. I mean, and also you'd be amazed at how they inflicted such beatings on each other and were still stood there swinging their hands. Uh, yeah, Obi Walker, incredible fighter. Amazing. Great job. Okay, so what is that? So is it just the last one to go? Is this it? You're the last man standing. You got it. All right, so let me just find my graphic here. All right, so this fighter is definitely underrated. But a lot of people who, who study the era know that he was a great fighter, but I just think he's underrated. I just wanted to give a shout out. I'm talking about Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, who's already come oh, up. Oh, yeah, definitely. In part because we're talking about fighters that today, a lot of them who you could say tried to fight everybody. Jack O'Brien was one of those guys, and he comes up with a lot of in the resumes of a lot of other guys who were trying to fight everybody. Jack O'Brien, tremendous career win loss record. Fought, and you look at the like George Cole came up, he beat George Cole seven times. George Cole was fantastic. In fact, after um, when Langford was training for Stanley Capsule, he went to a camp in New Jersey with George Cole. And I think George Cole cornered him. He was one of his guys, one of his seconds. Or corners for the fight with Stanley Capsule that they had in Philly. But Langford was out on the, he had, just, he had beaten, he had, you know, lost to Flynn and then won the rematch. And then I think he beat Jim Barry. And then and one other guy in between those fights. And then he went over. And yeah, so George Cole, great fighter. Jack O'Brien had his number. And Jack O'Brien had a lot of people's numbers. The lists on there, 
Mike Shrek came up. He beat Mike Shrek three times. Hugo Kelly has come up. He beat him twice. Jack Twin Sullivan came up because Jack Twin Sullivan gave Tommy Burns a loss on points. The fight before Tommy Burns beat Marvin Hart to win the white heavyweight title, basically. So, like, you know, Jack O'Brien. Jack O'Brien was a stylist. He was he was a hard character, but he was also like a businessman, a stylist. He's in Philly. He's basically, you call him the king of the six rounders. He fought, he did fe- fight longer fights, but he fought a tremendous amount of uh, six round bouts in his career. You actually mentioned him on your video, BL. I can't remember how many you said. I think maybe it was like 80, 80 something, six rounders in his career, distance fights. I believe so. Oh, it was uh, 89. 89. My goodness. I didn't want to inflate the number. And it's like, nope. This graphic here. This on the left side is the his, his record at the end of each year. On the right side in the parentheses is basically his record just for that season. And these are seasons. Look at this. So he, went, he, he does lose a few fights. But if you look, if you look at him starting in like 1898, after a couple seasons of fighting, right? Because he goes one zero and two, and then seven three and five. Okay, but look at like starting 1898, he goes, he goes uh, ten and one with four draws. 1899, he goes twelve and zero with two draws. The year after, ten and one with two draws. The year after, fifteen and zero. With no draws. The year after, 1902, one of the great seasons. I loved looking at this era as like a season sport with a variable schedule, but he got it in. 31 wins, no losses, one draw. 1903, 23 and one with two draws. This is 1904, 16 and two with a draw. And then it, it slows down to 7 1 and 1 in 1905, slows down to nine fights, only loses one. And then his career. It's like this, and, th- and then as his career is slowing down there, now he's mostly just having big fights. He's already had a lot of big fights, but a lot of the filler falls away. So he has, it's just, man, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien. He wrote a book. He would, uh, he's the, the famous footage of Harry Greb training and sparring a little bit. That's Philadelphia Jack O'Brien. That's, I think that was for the Mickey Walker fight. So BL, what year was the Mickey Walker fight? 1925. Yeah, so O'Brien has been retired for like 13 years. Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, he also worked quite a lot with Gene Tunick, working on uh, technique and sparring, things like that. Yeah, he's one of the, exactly. He's one of the great stylists of the early era. He was one of those guys who had the technique. And he's... Man, he could he he get it on. He was he, and he fought, you know. So when he got the the light he, light heavyweight claim, it was at a time when it was kind of like these are the guys who are like they're they're really just too big for middleweight. But it's not it's not like they're good. it was anchored on the fighters who had it. What was it? Jack Root, George Gardner, right? Correct. They were respected right. fighters, and then. Bob Fitzsimmons, respected fighter, and then Jack O'Brien, respected fighter. But he didn't really care. He was just going up to heavyweight. He wanted the heavyweight title. So the light heavyweight at this point was really was like a pathway to basically just go challenge for the heavyweight title. It's 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 like the junior division. Unfortunately, the colored heavyweight division was often treated kind of like light heavyweight, like a junior division to the real the real guys. But that was that was insecurity reinforced by the color line because as soon as they dropped the line jack johnson i say they but basically when tommy burns shout out to Noah brusso aka tommy burns when he dropped the color line and accepted the fight with johnson and lost that just put a lie to the whole mythology but then they redrew the line and started whitewashing history and stuff so like it was a weird time but jack o'brien he fought he didn't care. He just fought. He was a money man. So he fought busy schedule. He fought across racial lines. Dead serious guy. And, uh, but because he doesn't like, he had claims as well as that, that light heavyweight, uh, thing, but it was, this was a time before weight classes were defined. And so what exactly was middleweight and what exactly was this and that was still kind of free flow. 
not precisely, but so he had a claim at 158. But people are still debating if if middleweight should be 154 because that's where Fitz beat um, the original uh, Jack Dempsey, non parole Jack Dempsey. So they were like, well, it's, well, what is this? We're fighting at 156 now, 158 now. You know, and so then and later you go fast forward a few years. They're like, what? What is this? Once, why are these guys fighting at 165 and calling themselves middleweights? Like it was. So it's, you know, it's a complicated time. But for his pounds and for his schedule, this is an all time great fighter. I've unfortunately run out of time. I got to go to work. But Jack O'Brien, I absolutely had to get him in there. And look at that season. Look how clean that record is relative to how busy he is. A lot of those, maybe six rounders, but he's fighting ridiculously good fighters in and amongst that that's not a that's not a padded record the way like oh you won 15 fights nobody of note no there you go through his resume on box rack philadelphia jack o'brien great fighter both strictly talking about official decisions which is what box rack puts at the top of the page but if you scroll down and look at his counting newspaper decisions even more epic great fighter right there guys i can't thank you enough for uh for joining me for this I really do have to go, but if you want to just sign out while I put my shoes on, feel free. This is your opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I were nearly out of time as well, Random. Uh, but yeah, um, what a pleasure it's been uh, to join both of you guys for this great chat. And uh, I think we should do another again sooner this time. I think we almost left too big of a gap this time. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'll definitely look forward to the next one and hope any listeners enjoyed us talking about something different. We've done a lot of countdowns, but now we're trying to highlight some fighters who don't always get shouted out. And big shout out to Random, massive shout out to Scrapbook Boxing. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on here with you guys. Uh, I enjoy every single one of them to the core. Uh, and thank you for letting me be a part of it with, the, with you two gents. Thank you, BL. It's a pleasure being on the platform with you as always, always. Random, thank you so much for having us. And I know you got to run. And I just hope the audience appreciates what we have done and appreciate these fighters because that's who we're here to celebrate. See you guys well next said, time. Scott. Well said. Well said. Thank you, Random. Thank you for hosting. And uh, we'll talk again soon, buddy. Both yeah, my pleasure. This was really special. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks, for everyone, for just uh, participating in the chat. I will go and read it. I'm just trying... Uh, just trying to stay focused. I'm easily distracted. So we got away without the major distractions. Thanks for joining us. We'll do another panel discussion. We're, we're going to plan it and I'll, I'll post up the link on the channel once uh, ahead of time, once we have the thing. So thanks again and just have a great day. See ya.